Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay. So welcome to DevCon US 20, um, 2022. And this is launch. And this is the first session in this new. And I'm Jin Tao Wang uh, from Red Hat. I'm moderator today. Uh, so let me introduce the speaker. The speaker is Renu Chauhan. Uh, she's a senior project manager for Red Hat, and let's welcome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. As my colleague introduced myself, I am one of the senior project manager in a back. I take care of the Red Hat business in a back region. I'll quickly get you through this talk, which mentions about if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. This is mainly focusing about the health status of our community. How can you contribute much more to our open source community? What are the ways using which you can include everyone out there rather than winning the race alone? So this is how it is going to be. So how many of you recognize him? Ah, ah I am so, so happy to see all the hands up. <laughs> so he's Mr. Bean, who is trying to make a coffee. <clears throat> So right here, what he's trying is, he's just trying to balance out the uh, ingredients, you know, one of coffee which you want to make. But what is the appropriate proportion which you want to have in that? If you mess up with that, definitely you cannot make it a healthy coffee, a delicious coffee for yourself. This is the same rule which goes on with a community too. So how can you... in a community and to take everything along with you. So this particular uh, animation, it reminds that the role of a community is not to win the race alone. It is to make the whole community successful. So a very live example I would like to give you from my life. It was one of the times when we were a group of 35 folks who went out for tracking up on a hill. And it was having a group from different regions of the country. And we went out there. And one of my closest friends, she says that, you know, all of a sudden in the middle, she said, that, hey, I want to reach the, uh, reach the top of the hill, the first. <clears throat> and we was, OK, we just go ahead. We don't mind respecting her, you know, freedom to think on that basis. And uh, then what we realized that she reached the top of the hill the soon. She was, a, she was very happy. She was super excited. But when she was looking at the memories which we had in our phones, which we captured through the videos, she realized that she has missed a hell lot of the memories. She was not right in there in the picture. Though she could reach the top of the hill the soonest, she was the winner, what she felt like. But our community never does that. The leader of a community doesn't want to win the race. They always take its people all together. So now the question is how to be a good corporate citizen when participating in an open source such kind of projects. So for this, I'll say that while I started back uh, before running Red Hat, I didn't know even if in case something like open source communities exist in this world. I was working in a service-based organization. I got to know about the open source community. What I did the first, the earliest was I joined the community. At this particular point of time, I was not taking any task at my hand. I was not participating in, uh, you know, into such, any kind of a commitment where I can complete one task and I can deliver it to you now. So simply just join the community. Take belongingness for you or not even to hint it will take you approximately five five months or you know sometimes it can give you a click within a few seconds too it happens so for example i joined multiple open source communities but then i have realized after completing several projects too that now this is not a piece of work or an admiration for myself i should move on to some other community so wherever you feel that it, you are having an inclination towards it, just join the community. The first thing which you have to do is start very well. Do not overcome it. Do not 
it could try to exceed the expectations of its community. So in Red Hat, we do have a committee of practices uh, in which we are all the project managers or who are aspiring to be or the business analysts, such folks have joined in. That is very much confined to this professionalism area. And then I have seen that people overcome it, they get exhausted, and they leave the community very soon. So always start small. The next thing is understand the governance. This is a very important piece while you are working with any kind of community. Uh, different countries, different regions, they have different types of policies. They have different types of governance. When it comes to the governance, it is not always the typical policies which comes into the picture of the businesses, but it also the type of the governance which comes into the picture while handling the people, while handling the communications. So always try to understand them and then try to reach out to the bigger piece of communication then. <clears throat> this really helps. And uh, the next thing uh, which I really respect and I have also observed on one of the boots right here for the open source, open space technologies, which has been connected by RJ, he's sitting right here, uh, that Diversity and inclusion. This is a very important piece right here. So how to build and sustain diverse communities. It is a very, very fundamental thing which you should take care of while you are a part of any kind of open source communities and you are leading it. So one of the most fascinating thing which I could understand from RJ's booth is uh, wherever you are or whatever could happen that that could have been the only the case which could happen, you know, the thing which could, which was the best which could ever happen to somebody. This is a very fundamental thing which we, you have to understand. So how does it mean is, uh, there have been certain examples, cer certain circumstances in the community task where people committed, but they could not show up or they had very diverse ideas, which were sometimes off the track, but which were many times it was helping the community to grow, but they were not being heard. Maybe because many of the times that they were very much new to the community and the leaders who were practicing it, they should never ever understand that since this body is new, they do not know the know the background of the community, they this particular idea should not be that no. It is like having everyone being included, being inclusive of your ideas. So always, always provide organizational support to establish the identity groups. What do I mean by that is, for example, in one particular community, there must be somebody who is doing, who is very much excited to do the blogging thing, or maybe somebody else is there who is very much excited to do the presentation thing, but someone is not interested. He can prepare the presentation. He is very much reluctant to go out to the audiences and then to present it. So in such kind of scenarios, always provide them the organization means that, hey, if you need to present, if you need an assistance, I can be a co-speaker, which can give a confidence to that particular person. Next time, maybe he can lead a mega event. You never know. This, this really happens many of the times, right? Develop inclusive community leadership models. This is very much welcome in Red Hat. The open framework, open leadership framework. So, but actually, this uh, this is completely dependent on a person. Whether because no matter how many policies you have, no matter how many leadership models you have, but it should be somewhere down in your heart and in your mind when you are leading any open source project that it should have an open decision framework. It should have an open leadership framework. What do I mean by that is the very smallest example I'll give you is once I was um, I traveled to one of the events uh, back in India in Bangalore and we were just about to go to hang out in a coffee shop the Starbucks we were just taking we were in a queue we were just taking our coffees outside and then I realized that one of the member he said that hey buddy uh, can you go first and he was within our community then. So in this particular thing, we said, yes, of course. We always say, yes, of course. And then uh, one of the senior leaders who was available over there, 
he took care of the fact that he was standing at the rear end of the queue and he was making sure that each and everybody who is available on his team, they are getting the coffees first. By this small act of kindness or giving a priority to your team, it clearly showed that not only your ideas in the business models they work, but in the personal spaces too, where a good leader is very much open to include each and every of his team members the very first. So this really helps to build a very strong community, the open source community. The thing is, Nick, the strongest point which I find out is integrate DNI standards and best practices into the product life cycles. This is very much imperative when we are releasing a new product life cycle and it happens when we are having very crucial business standards on the table and then we want to discuss it. So one of the team was there, I remember back when I was into some other team within Red Hat and I released, uh, and I released that. there was an idea which was coming from an aggregate level and it was having a conflict with the principal engineer, the ideas which were there, which were brought up there. Made it convinced that the idea which was coming from an associate level, it was the right one, and it got implemented. No matter from where the idea is coming, once the inclusivity is the principle of the organization or of the community, it makes the decisions very good and the product life cycle is easy to get a release on. Okay, so so this is this is very much interesting since the open source communities they are very much geographically distributed they are across the different countries now the question is many times it happens that though english is a common language they all speak english but are we sending out the right intent what you mean through your words what does it mean is Many times somebody is in a problem within a community when they want to complete one particular task. They say it in simple words, but some people are not very much comfortable in uh, relaying their emotions through their words, you know. So in such kind of activities, you should have a very good connection. There should be a common language the standard language we should always try to break the language barriers out there because language it helps to bring people together all experiment communication people say for example many of the people say that I'm available on Google Chat, but I'm not available on Slack. But other region, they work only on Slack. But for the open source communities, there should be a defined mode of communication that for this community, if in case you have to commute, communicate something, this is the channel. This is the right and the most adopted channel. So this removes the confusion that shall, shall I go. Or I, I was speaking here. So kind of... When the very first one risk which I have realized is the lack of the motivation over the period of time. Though somebody joins the open source community, I don't feel motivated to contribute. So, and the second is sometimes the policies bring up into the people and this causes a risk. So, how can you overcome certain risks? It and enforce social risk policies and process. This is very much being by the community leaders. People having community managers for which there is an awesome you know, who is taking care of the policies the processes wherever there is some assistance whether it is about delivering a talk out there or applying to a different kind of a position within Red Hat the leaders the community leaders are always approachable they are the ones who scan even through resumes they just help you to know that which skills do you want to build so such kind of assistance is available but they are threatening policies today. the 
second thing is perform a full inventory of their open source software and also to map open source to vulnerabilities. So this comes through the product life cycles. Whenever there's something into the upstream, there is any kind of a code which you are pushing into the upstream and that is being utilized into the downstream. All of these policies come over there and <clears throat> identify the licensing risk. So licensing is a very, very huge topic which certainly is out of the purview of this particular presentation because it is something like which can go up to two and three hours of discussion because licensing is a very key thing in the open source software development, which, which is a proprietary of a particular organization, though it's open source, but something which belongs to one organization and licensing is the key to contribution as well as to utilization of the particular software. So people ask me why the open source? Why not? Why not do go with any other source or uh, which are available in the market? The open source communities. The very first thing is they help you to retain talent. There are an awesome pool of talent available out in the world. They are very much open. They do not want to stick to one organization something, but they want to make the the codes very much is available to each and everybody they are usually available around the globe so there is such kind of talent can be much helpful to the open source community as well as the community the maintenance cost of, of the open source community is very much less as to the is out there as well as the It is open to all. The motive is not to bring it to a success by delivering something, but it is the motive is to influence a vision. Once you can influence somebody towards a vision, you can bring in the success very easily. But it takes a lot of a courage as well as a lot of time to influence somebody. And for this, we need constant contributions into the open source communities. So now, how can I bring uh, or make an impact in an open source? The very first thing is build relationships at the ease. Right now, the is an example of that. Whenever you are having time, try to build up connections with different people, even if in case you have out on a Google chat or Google Meet, always make sure that you are building a connection. You feel that you know you need an and reach out to the person. Otherwise, it should be reaching Somebody asking you any query, try to give them an answer before they come back to you for a follow up. This really helps you to build a very strong connection. If the community is very much related to the software engineers who pushed out the course um, and then spend the work and keep it alive, regular setups with the internal stakeholders. So I can say that it is very much easy for me to catch up with someone to build a relationship and just to be in touch for a month or two. But it is very much important that you keep a regular sync up with them to keep a connect. Then only you can be, make your relationship alive with them. In the community practices, uh, you should be a part of the sync up team uh, sync up or the team meetings very oftenly or at least once in a month this really helps you to build your relationships the next thing is how to create your open source contribution strategy this is very much important why are these contributions important what open source projects do we use within the organizations uh, definitely you should always uh, strategize or you should always focus on the strategies that do we already have relevant expertise or do we need to upskill for it whenever you are making any contribution strategy you should always think of all these questions what should we promote our open source efforts how will we determine whether the plan is successful or not these are the things measurable things which you should measure before you go ahead and make any open source contribution strategy once you have all the answers for these after a self-realization, 
then only you can go ahead and measure of this you can have a plan for improving it because if some of the questions are there which you do not have a answer for then you can certainly would like to go back and think about how how can i make an impact or how can i make a contribution strategy utilizing this particular important piece of information so now the most important is whenever i go to any event most of the uh, people they walk to me and they ask me that hey apart from just the code how can i contribute to the open source because red is a very much tech oriented organization or most of the open source communities are for example for mansible but up what can i do so honestly speaking when i started into the open source contribution it was not like that i was only into the technical part though i was into technical but it was not only technical then i started making the blogs it really helped the people learn about the different products and the technologies the contributions the different events which were having what is the impact of those events all of this information was proven to be very much helpful to them whenever you you find a opportunity if you are into qe you can become a tester for the particular community for testing out a few uh, codes if not then you can write down the documentation this is very much useful when it comes to the technical writing or the non technical writing there are certain opportunity within the community where you can write down the product documentation if not then you have the uh, leverage you have the uh, freedom for writing some of the feature uh specifications about the product there that is at the moment when you can use your writing skills then is definitely become a translator if you can it has helped me in handling some of the projects where i was working in apac and it was specifically related to japan where some of the community members they helped me as a translator and it was a very very big success for us in the event whenever you need um, a or you can help the design and other questions for example in the um i of the posters which they could make these are just contributions which they could help us out with also give a talk at a user group meeting wherever you feel there is an opportunity and it is very much relevant for your audiences go ahead and deliver a talk it really helps community members answer about the questions and the thing which i have out is suggest a feature this is very much important whenever you are in a team meeting where there is something being pushed to the upstream now there is something you hesitate to contribute such kind of contributions lead to very good product features in some of the ways so before i go ahead so are you ready to measure how you can contribute to the open source communities if yes you are good to go if not then please go ahead and think that how and you can uh, make a contribution strategy by looking at some of the questions and then what are the improvement areas which you could figure out that's all from my side do you have any question for me now uh-huh So if I could understand your question how can I get the metrics about the number of the Yeah yeah Sure so and uh, how can you measure so there are certain parameters which are there which are very much specific and they vary from community to community the communities which i have led um, they are very much uh, important when it comes to delivery of certain tasks to the upstream as well as the non technical kind of thing which i have handled is related to the people aspirations then uh, what do they aspire for are they getting what they are aspiring for are they upskilling for that 
so if not then means the health of the particular community is not what is the to go for if they are not hitting that particular thing in one year time span for example they are the people who tell me that this is the amount of time in which i am aiming that i should be there if not it means there is something which we need to treat the way which in the fashion in which we are working within the community that needs to be treated then yeah so you do that by I have a microphone now no. uh, do, by, by surveys okay and do you do a, a regular survey of yeah. the community we, the frequency is after every few months yeah 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 Thank you everyone for attending the talk. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to DevConf US uh, 2022. And 
Jing Tao on the moderator. Uh, and th this session, the speaker is uh, Emily Johnson, uh, quality engineer at Red Hat. Let's welcome her. Um, so this is the session formerly titled Open Tech Education Case Study Something and Something Else. The full title I wanted was from Player to Python, but that was too many characters, but it adds more. Uh, I'm Emily Johnson. I'm a quality engineer at Red Hat currently, uh, but as you may have surmised from the title and summary of the talk, I actually got a degree in psychology initially and was a school teacher and made the rather abrupt pivot to tech. Uh, so we're gonna kind of get into how that happened. Uh, so our basic contents are that story. Uh, and then we're gonna dive a little bit into massive open online courses, also known as MOOCs. Uh, and that is one of the things that I used that was completely free to get me into learning how to code. Uh, and then we're gonna go into some of the research about both MOOCs and uh, open coding resources and how that looks demographically and uh, what backgrounds people are coming from to use those. So what can you do with a BA in psychology? It turns out, uh, especially in North Carolina, where I live, you can teach preschool. And that was great. It was rewarding. But after about a year, I was getting burned out at 22, which is not a good time to start being burned out. So I was looking around for what else I could do. You know, if I wanted to stay in psych, I could have gone to grad school, gotten a PhD, PsyD, something like that. I was kind of staring down many years of extra school in a field I wasn't entirely sure about anymore. Uh, and my boyfriend at the time suggested trying to learn code. And I was like, yeah, I'm not really mathy. Don't really do that. And it, like, turns out, as we all might know, the computer does the math for you. You just have to know logic and be a little creative. So I started with uh, codecademy.org. I learned Python. Uh, it went pretty well. The initial things were like building, you know, a text-based game based on the Zelda game. So I would like build Link's backpack. It was all very fun. Um, and yeah, I realized I loved it. I was decently okay at it, learning at least. So I moved on to edx.org where they host actual classes from universities. I took Harvard's CS50 or most of it as we'll get to. Uh, and that is actually a MOOC, a massive open, open online course. Um, and other things I used were Project Euler. Uh, they have like little code challenges. It's a pretty old school website, but like it works really well for learning. And some of the programming challenges on Reddit actually were very helpful. Uh, so then just continue my story. I actually ended up after using all those free resources, realizing I really wanted to go for it and went back to school for a second bachelor's degree. Uh, I went to Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I attended part-time for two years, got another degree. Uh, and then in the first semester of that, I was actually hired by IBM as a co-op. Uh, I actually worked full-time while attending school, and the psychology degree, A, was good to get me in the door because they were like, great, she already has a degree. B, uh, I was working as a support engineer, so in order to deal with customers and write things that they will be able to understand. It did help to understand how people think, and it did help to be able to uh, deal with difficult people, both in you know my preschool background, the parents and the kids, and that really did translate to angry customers sometimes. Um, after that, I was hired full-time at IBM. Uh, I then moved, so I got a job at a tiny place called Systems Engine Incorporated, and then about a year ago, I was hired at Red Hat. There's my first day at Red Hat during the pandemic with my messy home office behind me. So zooming in a little bit on MOOCs. So I took almost one MOOC. Um, it was Harvard CS50, which is pictured there. So they are massive open online courses, which means they are almost always free. They're put together by universities, occasionally companies. Um, so there are some paid offerings. For example, if you want to get a certificate that says, yes, I did complete this, that you can show an employer or something. I never went in for that, but I think you can also put together like a degree program and that's a little bit more official, but you have to pay for that. But if you're just there to learn, you don't have to pay anything. Um, they gained popularity in the early 2010s and they're hosted on these various platforms. EDX in particular is the one I used. Uh, it was put together by MIT and Harvard, but a lot of other universities have their courses on there now. 
Um, and they can be self-paced. You don't necessarily have to start at a specific time. It's not like, oh, this course runs, you know, April through whatever. It's just start when you find it on the internet. Uh, and many of them are auto-graded, which means, you know, you submit an assignment, especially if you're writing code, like, does it do the thing it's supposed to do? Does it have the inputs, outputs? Pretty easy. And then for more subjective things, there can be a peer feedback situation where, like, you'll grade five people's and someone will grade yours. Um, that has been shown to be a little bit less reliable, but, you know, that's kind of how these things go. So the early completion rates, some people looked at moves actually pretty bad, um, around 10%. If you looked at people who intended to complete the courses, it was closer to 30%, which is still not great. Uh, but as I mentioned, I didn't actually complete the one MOOC I was enrolled in. I did most of the work and kind of just dropped off as I got into other things. And I still learned a lot. Like it put me on a great course for um, going back to school. And I really you know, had a solid foundation by the time I actually got to use the stuff. So completion is good, but not necessarily necessary. Um, computer science courses have been found to have like the largest, um, they've been the largest magnet basically to these things. And uh, if people are moving on to other areas, they often move from computer science. So it brings people in and it gets them interested in other topics, which is cool. Uh, so a study of the University of Pennsylvania's MOOCs on Coursera found that 60% of those enrolled were over age 30, 79.4 had a bachelor's degree and 50% were employed full time. So the initial promise of MOOCs was kind of, you know, bring education to the masses, higher education, make it free, make it open, everyone can do it. These numbers show that it's a bit self-selecting. It's probably people who have already had the opportunity to get education, but it can also bring people in from different backgrounds and areas to learn something new. Like if you're bringing people in with computer science who already have a degree in something else, it can bring people to the field. So overall impacts and effectiveness are still, there's, you know, all studies are being done by people who are at traditional universities learning traditionally. So there's a little bit of like hand wringing and hemming and hawing, like, oh no, is this going to be disruptive or is it going to be as high quality? But nobody's really sure. And everybody kind of agrees that having things, you know, open and accessible is very convenient and has still some promise. So who is using these resources? Um, this is survey data from freecodecamp.org. So not a MOOC, but a place where you can come and learn various languages, do exercises for free. 28% uh, of their new coders were women, non-binary, transgender, or gender fluid. These aren't going to be apples to apples numbers comparisons because the other two, uh, I think, were just divided into women and men. But 19% of comp sci degree recipients at the same time were women, and 24% of tech jobs were by women. Uh, I think that's in the US. So it's maybe a little better, not like a silver bullet or anything, but you know, you can still see the potential to get people in the door. Um, of those in the US, 45.4% were non-white and 38% of American tech jobs are currently held by non-white employees. So again, a little better. Um, of those who were not already developers, 90% were interested in software development jobs, which means people from different fields and different backgrounds trying to get into the field, all good. And 43% already had a bachelor's degree. So our MOOC numbers to be like, well, you know, it's people who are already uh, educated on a higher level, but that can bring in different perspectives, tech field. So let's talk about benefits to the learners from these courses. Uh, you can get skills and knowledge without paying any money, no cost of traditional group degrees or even boot camps, which can be like ten dollars to $20,000. Um, Self-paced courses, easier to fit in busy schedules if you already got a job, obviously. Uh, there's no intimidation factor. You don't show up and, you know, you're around a bunch of other people and one kid's already raising their hand and they know everything. Like, there's nothing like that. You just get to sit on your computer and learn. And then... You can sample a field without commitment. You know, you can try a course in something that's completely new to you that you've never heard before and be like, is this for me? Before you have to go enroll in something or pay somebody money. For companies, uh, this has the potential, as we saw, you know, it's not revolutionizing yet, but the potential to result in uh, employees with more diverse backgrounds. And that is shown to result in better team performance. There's actually uh, a study that shows that software projects specifically do benefit from diverse teams. And uh, companies' financial performance overall can be better. 
Uh, and then beyond that, this can create a larger pool of developer candidates overall. We all might know that it is really hard to hire people who know how to write code right now. It would be better if there were more. Uh, so companies can help by providing their training materials for free. You know, not necessarily everything they've got, but if they have a field where they're like, wow, we really wish we had more people who knew X, put the materials for X out there. Uh, and not requiring formal degrees for technical roles, which, you know, everybody has that little part on the job description that's like, or equivalent experience. They could spell that out. They could be like, hey, if you've taken the initiative to go like learn a software thing that nobody has or even that we need, um, we can, you know, take that into account rather than just being like, hmm, okay, do I have a BA? Do I not like spell it out for people? Uh, so those are all my sources. I've got the slides, I think, posted to the sketch listing, uh, if anybody would like to go dig into those. But I have spoken very quickly and finished early. Does anyone have questions? Cool. Any for anecdotes about preschool and or dealing with customers? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's oh, I, I wanted with the anecdote. Oh, <laughs> request for anecdote. That's very fair. Um, yeah, I think I've had preschool parents and tech customers try to like bait me in the same way. <laughs> um, preschool parents can, you know, come on this academic lamp and let's just be teaching for you. Is play that in school, and then was like, you know, what are their vocab words? Um, so then I was actually for a little while um, working at the preschool and going to school part time for tech, and then I immediately switched over. Like one Friday, I stopped at preschool, and the next Monday, I started at IBM. Uh, and when I dealt with customers, sometimes they would come to me like, you know this product project is just so critical to our business that like by you not immediately helping me, you are killing my small business. Okay, you're installing a server. I don't think it's life or death. It's not even up yet. I really don't understand how I could be hindering your development in such a way. So you can see how the skills really translated. Obviously that's a customer service thing that sometimes people um, Let's see. should have pre come up with more anecdotes, but oh yes, go ahead. Of course. I oh, going back on the last and in the job descriptions, expanding the language around that. Were there I mean that I really like that example. That's a that's a um that's a classic one that one would sort of like gloss over privilege and go, oh sure I can expand in my mind what that would mean, but can everybody do that expansion? Not silly. And um and I know that there's some efforts underway, like at Red Hat, for example, the company do about like having a review of job descriptions around inclusive language. And so were there some other aspects, were there other things that you found? I mean, that, that was that was clearly one that jumped out for you. Are there other ones that had jumped out for you or the things that it, within that um, uh, in, uh, inclusive language and ways of making people, especially with the non-traditional roots, um, how, how often we just, that there can be these biases in the system that are written in there, nobody thinks to change it kind of thing and stuff like that. So if you want to expand on any more thoughts on that. Um, I mean, I think it's about, you know, both being explicit with the company's language and everybody being aware. Like, if you just have a talk with your team about, like, hey, where did everybody come from? Because not everybody necessarily, you know, graduated high school, went to college, got the bachelor's degree in exactly what they were going to do for the rest of their lives and started doing that job. Um, so you can kind of just gain awareness around you of, you know, where different people might be coming from. Um, and... Yeah, I guess if you wanted to like, you know, more formalize it, um, really make it an effort. Like if we're trying to, you know, expand our teams into more diversity, like put that in, you know, some of your DEI research and uh, goals to be like, hey, you know, look at where people are coming from and make it an actual point to look different places. Like, you know, can recruit engineering centers, or you can just, you know, go to a liberal arts college and see what's up. Um, but yeah, excellent question. Thank you. 
Anybody else? All right. Well, I think. Thanks very much.
Welcome everyone uh, to the next talk in Terrace Lounge. My name is Kamesh. I'll be the moderator for this session. And um, let's uh, give a warm applause to Eric for his talk. Thank you. So when I, when I booked the flight to come out here, um, Red Hat's travel software informed me that um, the process of uh, flying myself from uh, Phoenix to uh, Boston to be in front of you today um, injected about a half a metric ton of uh, carbon into our atmosphere. Um, yeah, I'm curious how many, how many people uh, have seen this kind of uh, carbon report on their travel uh, bookings? Yeah, okay. Um, I expect this to become more and more common as uh, these things progress. Um, so my name is Eric Rolinson, software engineer at uh, Red Hat. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, scaling the open source uh, climate community. Um, and so I'll be describing um, sort of like briefly like what OS climate is and what it's trying to do. Um, and then I'm going to talk about, of course, uh, what we're doing to scale. Um, and of course, we talk a lot about scaling with things like uh, compute and data, and I'll be talking some about that as well. Um, but I'm also going to talk about scaling um, the ability of the community to manage its own deployments and um, scaling the actual community itself and actually scaling governance um, uh, in a sense over all the rest of these um, elements. Um, if you find, find these topics interesting, um, I was at a, another conference recently um, and saw a great talk um, by these two gentlemen on the perils of building a democratic data platform. And um, it was a, they had their own uh, perspective on a lot of the same issues I'll be dealing with. And so if you find these things fascinating, um, I highly recommend uh, checking out this talk. There's a link at the bottom um, when the deck circulates. Um, so what is the goal of uh, the OS climate community? Um, the estimated total sum of financial activity uh, and investment um, over the planet Earth um, circa around 2020 was some number north of like 200 trillion euros. Um, so OS climate basically wants to align as much of that human economic activity as possible um, with the goal of controlling global temperature rise. Um, so in a sense, we're trying to scale the climate impact of human investment. Um, so what does that, what does that look like? Um, there's a lot of ways you can slice this problem. Um, one of the ones that we're actually got working um, relatively early is called asset alignment. Um, so what does that mean? Well, suppose you have um, an investment portfolio and you know you can actually with this tool which we are deploying on the OS climate clusters um, you know select a benchmark like down in the uh, lower left here um, you know the standard like 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius temperature rise people are trying to keep um, <clears throat> keep our carbon emissions so that it stays under this limit um, you can see over here um, they actually measure, if you look at all the uh, emissions pertaining to the companies in this portfolio, um, they're not meeting the goal. Um, so um, this is, you know, pr providing this kind of tool to the people who create investment products and also to the people who purchase them um, is one of the main um, functions that we're hoping to support. Um, so asset alignment consists of a couple of different things. Um, there's physical risk alignment and transition risk alignment. Um, physical risk is probably the one people are be intuitively familiar with. Um, you're basically trying to federate a lot of different kinds of data, data about uh, potential hazards like wind, wind speed, temperature rise, floods, um, combined with like the actual location, the physical locations of corporate assets. Um, and link that again to like the financial investment data that I just showed. Um, so the idea is of course, that if you're a company um, 
that maybe owns another company and it sits on a river and that river starts flooding more often because of climate change, that's a physical risk impact to uh, the value of your investments. Um, the tra transition risk is slightly more um, esoteric. It has to do with the risks we impose on ourselves um, by the policy choices we make as governments um, or societies. Um, and so here again, you're trying to, you know, federate data about um, energy, energy source choices um, and, you know, the policies like say we pass legislation to, you know, increase wind power and stuff like that or the failure to do those things um, and what the actual impacts uh, might be again to all of our, you know, physical assets that embody all of our uh, economic activity. Um, so as you can see, OS Climate works in the uh, ESG arena, which uh, is the increasingly popular acronym for uh, environmental, social, and governance concerns. Um, so there are obviously tons of challenges to addressing this kind of problem. Um, you know, <clears throat> regulatory roadmaps are constantly changing. Um, Again, as I mentioned, like, you know, there's physical risk and transition risks um, that are, you know, challenging to federate the data for and keep track of. Um, and there's a lot of just data challenges in terms of like, you know, actually banks are unable to um, <clears throat> often get access to this data or don't have the resources unless they're very large to properly process it in a way that they can actually make use of in the ways I've been describing. Um, and it's even worse than that, of course, because not all um, not all stakeholders are necessarily honest. Um, you know, they misreport their values or report them in misleading ways. Um, so you're having to deal with uh, possibly you know dishonest data or incorrect data just by accident. Um, that problem has become so acute that uh, just this May the SEC submitted a proposal um, do a number. Um, to, broad things, quote unquote, with respect to a registered ESG fund. So you must now provide um, investors with information in these investment prospectuses of like what ESG factors are actually considering um, and uh, then disclose, you know, like what the data they're using to compute the values they're reporting and what metrics they're actually using, which includes things like, you know, what units they're reporting in. Um, So you can see that, uh, you know, competing these for something like uh, greenhouse gases um, or other kinds of pollutants um, require a lot of complex relations. Um, there's different scopes to this. Scope one is sort of like direct emissions. Like if you're a company that owns a factory and it has a smokestack, you know, that's scope one. It's pushing carbon out. Um, scope two is things where, you know, you're basically purchasing energy. Um, that may have emissions. Um, so again, like, you know, my flying out here could be construed as a scope two impact uh, for Red Hat. Um, or when we purchase, you know, computing power out on the cloud and from somebody's like AWS and AWS is purchasing, um, you know, electricity from somebody, that's kind of like a scope three kind of uh, a level. It's like there's a different levels of indirection. And so in order to compute these things, um, you actually need to be able to track you know, what companies own who um, and what, you know, what companies are in the supply chains. Um, so one, one piece of data we've actually stood up relatively early on our platform is the uh, Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation data set, GLIFE, um, which contains basically nothing but these relationships. It's like what companies exist, what are their legal identifier um, numbers and, you know, who, who they own, who owns them, et cetera. Um, and so you can see uh, being able to walk through this data and trace it is crucial to being able to sum up scope two and scope three um, in climate impacts. OS Climate, it's an open community um, and it's open in a sense of open source, but also open data and open uh, ops and open governance. And I'll be trying to talk about all these factors as I go. Um, so by the numbers, um, 
this number is slightly out of date. There you have just shy of 200 uh, individual members. Uh, now I think it's 195. Um, there's around 10 community projects that have been started and around 50 repositories and probably more than 20 data sets at this point. Um, and the general story is that over the last six months or so, um, all of these have just about doubled in size. So it's a fairly rapidly growing community. Um, and um, if you want to explore further, like what OS Climate is doing, what we're all up to, I encourage you to uh, check out these links. Um, that's the OS Climate website and our actual GitHub org. Um, I'll not be talking too much more about like the specifics of the tasks. I'm gonna be talking about how we actually scale some of the uh, community activities. Um, so at the lowest level is one we're often familiar with, um, you know, scaling compute. Um, and so our model, um, is that we run on a Kubernetes cluster and it's running on top of uh, AWS. And so of course, um, Kubernetes allows you to scale your workloads using um, you know, pods, deployments that can be expanded or contracted and AWS provides actual scalable compute hardware. Um, this is a fairly common um, organization of compute activity these days. A show of hands, like how many people use this kind of um, environment to scale their own stuff? Okay. Maybe a third of you. Um, so again, you know, at a, you can talk, tell AWS to increase the size of your uh, number of servers and I can ask um, Kubernetes to, you know, scale out the number of pods in my Trino deployments. Um, so of course that was scaling out. There's also scaling up. And so again, I can ask AWS to give me, you know, servers with more CPUs uh, or more RAM and just literally scale the hardware up. Um, and similarly, I can do the same thing at the uh, Kubernetes control plane and say, look, I just need this pod to have more memory to do my data science or more CPUs. Um, So um, in the case of OS Climate, the particular flavor of Kube we're using is uh, OpenShift. Um, and AWS um, actually donated the uh, sort of like compute credits to run the cluster. But as we all know, um, running these things uh, costs money. Um, and so again, it's a Here's a, here's a useful example of cultivating relationships for your community to obtain resources that allow you to scale, because otherwise we'd be having to find a way to pay, you know, pay that money ourselves. Um, so next we'll talk about scaling data. Um, the main data architecture currently operating is um, Trino, which is a scalable database. Um, and it's using S3 buckets um, as its backing store. And of course, we are also just literally exposing some S3 buckets directly for certain purposes. Um, so we're using the we're using the S3 object stores in three different scalable ways. The first is sort of like a physical landing bucket. We provide one. Um, community members can also bring their own bucket. Um, so that's an example of basically, you know. Community, da community da data scaling. Um, and again, as I said, we're using it as the backing store for um, <clears throat> all of our Trino uh, SQL databases. Um, and also um, when we do uh, Kubeflow pipelines and other kinds of pipelines, it's generally providing the backing store for intermediate results. Um, so Trino is, um, designed to expose a SQL interface um, to a user, but under the hood, um, it scales out the computation of all the queries that you give it um, using you know, pods on some kind of cluster. Um, and so in this respect, um, anybody who's ever worked with something like uh, Spark structured streaming might find this kind of similar or to you know, exposing running SQL queries against Spark. It, Spark can do basically the same thing. However, Trino, um, unlike Spark, was designed natively to run in a cluster and do this. And so it turns out that it's somewhat easier to get this kind of deployment working to do scalable, you know, database-like operations. Um, another way it scales is federation. Um, it comes with over 
three dozen connectors at this point, and they're writing more all the time. Um, and so what it allows you to do, again, somewhat like Spark, is um, <clears throat> declare a connection to somebody else's data, and as long as it's in one of the formats that it knows how to talk to. Um, I think the, some of the ones that are of particular interest to us are um, like Google BigQuery and Iceberg, um, and Kafka may be coming too. And then also, of course, it knows how to ingest uh, CSV and Parquet files. And so, again, suppose you want to um, take something like a CSV file and get it into a database table um, on our Trino deployment, which is running on top of an Iceberg connector. So it's basically leveraging Iceberg's data versioning at a very fundamental level. Um, I wanted to provide the community with some standard tooling to do this. And so I wrote a little um, Python class called Trino Batch Insert, and you can use it as a method argument to um, <clears throat> the standard sort of like pandas to SQL method. And um, I just taught it how to talk to Trino. Um, and so this is an example, again, of community scaling um, via providing people standard tools. So I wanted to say, look, I'll figure out how to do this and I'll give you guys a function to do it so nobody has to like reinvent the wheel. Um, so how did this work? Well, the UX was good. You can see it's actually pretty simple. You just give it a simple call like this. Lots of people know how to do pandas to SQL. Um, unfortunately, we found out relatively fast that the scalability is terrible. Um, it was fine for like the testing I did, but when people tried to start ingesting real data like into the you know hundreds of megabytes or gigabyte class, um, you know, it, immediately started taking multiple days to cycle through. Um, so that was untenable. Um, so I went back to the drawing board and <clears throat> tried a different method. Um, another another connector that Trino can use um, is Hive tables. And it knows, Trino knows how to do a clever trick with Hive tables. Um, if you push a bunch of stuff onto S3, you can simply tell Trino hey, here's some parquet files in a structure. I would like you to treat this as a database table. And that's effectively instantaneous. Um, and then you can run a SQL insert command from the hive into the iceberg. And because that's basically letting Trino do the thing it's designed to do very well, it's much faster. Um, now the UX obviously slightly more complicated, but it is literally 70 times faster to uh, ingest data. So um, it was a massive win. Um, and again, I exposed this, uh, I took all this and wrapped it up in a function so that people don't necessarily have to manually do all this. They can call a function, it does all this under the hood. Um, so let's talk about scaling deployments. Um, we have some goals. Um, you know, we want deployments to actually be configurable by all the OSC community members um, and discussion and reviews and approval um, of all these kinds of deployment changes should be all full in the open um, and also durable. Um, so the way we did this was leveraging the uh, Operate First community. Um, their purpose is to basically take open source principles and apply them to actual um, deploying and operations in the open, so operate first. Um, so how does that work? Um, suppose you're a open source climate community member. Um, you want to change the deployment on our clusters. You do this by submitting a uh, pull request via Git um, and the operate first uh, GitHub org. And it usually basically means modifying things like customize overlays and YAML, the you know the kinds of things that um, Kubernetes clusters know how to talk. Um, so here's an example of one I did. I just wanted to upgrade the uh, database, um, the Trino database to a new version. And so I submitted a pull request. You can see it right here. It's a very simple one. Um, but the main point the main point is it's all sitting up on Git. You guys could all go look at this and see the history, see who talked about it, uh, who approved it. Um, and so again, you basically get the entire open source process of uh, discussion and review. Um, in a durable way up on GitHub. Um, and once the discussion finishes and you merge something, uh, we have an Argo deployment running through the Operate First project that detects these changes. 
and says, okay, I got a new thing to sync up and resyncs the deployment out on the actual physical cluster um, and you have a change and it's all been done using open source principles. Um, so again, this is a great way to, uh, you know, scale out the community's ability to uh, make changes to things um, themselves, but have review and full um, durability. So I got five minutes, so I better hurry up. Um, so the last thing I actually want to talk about scaling uh, community. Um, the primary way we've done this uh, is with self-service environments. So as an OS community, climate community member, um, I can basically authenticate to our cluster via my GitHub ID. So it's easy for everybody, anybody with a GitHub. And that also gives me um, authenticated access to a Jupyter environment, superset, um, which both are connected to Trino, which is also using the same authentication methods. Um, and all of this is being uh, installed here uh, using the uh, Open Data Hub project. Um, so basically, you have unified authentication, which is a great way for people to, you know, <clears throat> get access to a lot of tooling without a lot of overhead. Um, so one GitHub ID authenticates to all of the uh, tooling we're running. Um, we also am scaling with GitHub templates. So if somebody wants to onboard uh, previously, you know, you could either talk to some OSC admin with a bunch of channels. Um, none of it was organized and it was Worse than that, because the admin was usually me. Um, so what I did was I created some uh, GitHub issue templates where people can basically say, I want to onboard, I'm going to use this template. And so it would get them to give me the required information. Um, so things like, you know, the GitHub team names, their username. Um, it gives a little task list for people to make sure everything happens. Um, it gave some standardized labels uh, and assignees. Um, so again, basically, this allows you know things to be organized far better. Um, in the future, we want to take this and do expand it to actually doing some automation uh, on GitHub. Um, so scaling governance um, at the community level, we're doing this fundamentally like a cloud native compute foundation, where you know you kind of have a rough one-to-one -one relationship between participants, a data product they want to provide, a GitHub project, or a, you know, and an actual Trino schema, schema that they can use for their purposes. Um, and we're running out of time. I'm gonna skip over that. Um, so future work, we want to, um, you know, again, leverage, leverage some of our, uh, domain specific languages to improve automation of Trino credentialing. Uh, we need to do metadata management, um, integrate code with like, you know, data versioning, either via things like Pachyderm or a combination of DVC and DBT. Um, and so oh, that was a lot of work to do and we had trouble. So the last thing I wanna talk about is actually scaling human participation. Um, sometimes even if you're using a very clever technique, if the problem is big enough, you just gotta throw a lot of people at it. Um, so how did we do this? Well, we fostered a relationship and became a member of the Linux Foundation. Um, and this allowed us to access some of the Linux Foundation's um, DevOps people to assist the Operate First community in doing some of our deployments. Um, one of the ones that, that freed us up to do recently was uh, open metadata. So now our data tables are actually browsable. Um, whereas before they weren't. So again, this has been a massive uh, community scaling uh, win um, by acquiring new dev resources. Um, so to summarize, um, how to scale your community, you should build on platforms uh, that are designed to scale. Um, federate your systems like Trino and your data and also your uh, governance principles. Uh, Try to make your environments self-service so you're not trying to like do things for people. They can do things for themselves and access tools. Um, and introduce complexity only when necessary. Otherwise, try the simplest thing first. Um, and publish libraries to standardize patterns of operations. Um, build, build on solutions that actually facilitate automation. Um, and cultivate 
strategic relationships that give you access to resources. Um, so anyway, I hope that inspired you to uh, go forth and uh, scale your own communities. Um, and thanks a lot for attending. Thanks, Eric. Well, kind of shout into the mic. It was a great talk. Um, one of the I, I wanted to draw back to a point that you had made a moment there where you made a um, a form to have people fill out to do that part for them. And what I wanted to catch on that is there um, you, that same kind of process of uh, adding yourself to the GitHub group. Like somebody can go in and make a pull request for themselves to do this piece. And this was an example of where you identify. It seems like you identified that that was a barrier to people to entry to people getting that initial set up and then you, that you chose to do a human position here as opposed to a self-service action because it accomplished a goal. And, and I think, I mean, I'm, I don't want to tell your story because I'm curious what, what led you to here and why you did this particular piece. The benefits just in terms of organizationally. Um, but what I really hoped to do, which I haven't gotten to yet is to follow this up with you know, again, automating. Um, so like you could write a GitHub action that would detect the creation of this, and then it could do some of these things automatically that we are doing manually. Um, this part has not happened yet, but it, this was basically a strategic positioning to get some benefit immediately, but then set us up for actual automation. We're gonna create a problem, huh? So rather than leaving the individual because a person could go make that same kind of pull request to themselves against the um um i'm sorry is it is it prebolos right that's doing the that's doing the github organizational changes when you, you so there's a the, the 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 onboarding request form that you did there some of that included pieces that somebody could theoretically go and set up for themselves if they knew how to do all the pathways, right? Like going and make. That's an actual GitHub issue form. You know, I can like tell GitHub to give standard forms when you get. So like a large part of that they can't do for themselves. They have to add, you have to be like an administrator of the GitHub org to make certain changes to put them as memberships of special groups that govern the uh, OpenShift access. So that pieces that they couldn't do that themselves. Uh, yes, some. If you can do it with the pull request, they can do it themselves. This was act. So yeah, it's like it's like GitHub console stuff. So it's a little different, but. Yeah, you know, there's like a lot of different Git here. <laughs> Can you go a little bit into uh, the different kinds of consumers of this data? It seems like you're focused on the like ETF issuers, but uh, it also seems like there's a whole swath of different audiences, maybe. Really a lot of audiences. I mean, like on an example that um, I'm trying to pursue right now is, um, of course, people are trying to bring ESG reporting like into the Kubernetes control plane. Um, there was a talk yesterday here uh, about the pro Kepler project, which I recommend people go check out. Um, but of course, if you want to increase the fine grained reporting, um, of what your compute resources are actually using. Let's say you wanted to know hour by hour, like how much solar versus how much coal my compute was using. You actually have to have access to like where the physical location of the, uh, you know, compute resources were, what power plant they were, power grid they were drawing from. So like all of that becomes like a com not another federation of things like, you know, physical locations and reported data about grid power, you know, sources um so i would like to see that hosted on the us climate community i think it's highly aligned but it would actually be being consumed 
by Kepler. <laughs> Uh, that's one example, but the, uh, there are many. I, like I, much more, frankly, than I'm probably even aware of. How are students at educational institutions um, working to, like, enhance the OS climate community and what you were mentioning? student activity. Um, however, it is, um, again, a fully open community. And so we, if there are like student organizations or even individual students that want to contribute in this space, um, it's all fully, it's a fully open community and it's fully open source. And so like I would wel welcome that kind of involvement. Also, um, oh, microphone problem. Um, also, I'm wondering, um, uh, do you know how um, the community grew in the last year? Do you have any statistics on how the OS climate community grew? Again, the, the, the size here is actually slightly larger now. These are numbers that are about eight weeks old, but uh, um, again, I think basically those doubled, all roughly doubled in the last half year. So. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks, everybody.
this one, I think. Huh? I think one of these. Is that one there? Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Hello. Hi. How are you? My name is Aoife Maloney, if you want to flick to the, the directors. So that one is me. Uh, you pronounce the name Aoife backwards, drop a couple of the letters, and I am the um, product owner on the community platform engineering team. I'm going to talk to you today about how we've changed our planning styles. We're still going to, we still plan our work, but we just do it in what we find is a little bit more fun and a little bit more human. Uh, I'm here today as well with uh, one of the CP managers. I'll leave you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Eva. Yep, my name is Stefan Mattiate. So um, the accent and the name they don't they don't uh, match. But anyway, um, so yeah, look, I've over 20, 20 years of experience in IT. Uh, I joined the CP team a couple of years ago, uh, and when I came in, I had some new ideas maybe to bring to the team. So this is what we're here for today. Okay, move on. So yeah, so look. Just the schedule, so uh, we start off with a bit of history, just around you know where the team was, what we were doing, and uh, we then move on to auditions, so some of the resources we use, the trial and erroring that we kind of that we did, uh, the dailies then, just the detail, our new approach, uh, editing, what did the whole thing look like when we put it all together, because there was a few different parts of it, um, some awards maybe, um, so just stakeholder feedback, and then maybe some questions and answers in the, in the interview section. So that's it. Can we go? Okay, so you've probably been listening to a lot of technical talks for the last two days, maybe three days of you here for the dojo as well. This is not going to be technical at all, but it's important if you plan with technical teams. So, and you need to have people talking because sometimes we're not very good at communicating with each other, especially not when we're on calls and remote. And the best way to make good decisions, good planning is to actually talk through and be comfortable with the people that you're with talking about things. So. This is kind of a rough overview of the timeline that we were looking at in the CPE team. Um, the whole planning process is based on agile concepts and a lot of the team were allergic to agile when it came in. <laughs> so we've had to kind of water it down an awful lot, not waterfall it a lot, but. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, we were introducing this concept to the team, didn't like us. Uh, I came on, they liked me. Um, then we were looking at changing our processes and they were awful because they were way too agile for us. Um, so then we figured out our own way and now we're here today just to share it with everybody because we really enjoy our planning now. And I would like to think the team do as well. They mightn't admit it, but I think they do. Okie dokie, so this is why we were bored out of our minds with the original approach. Because <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a spreadsheet. Like, it's a spreadsheet about technical stuff. And yep, very effective. You can see the names of the projects we were doing. It was linked to more documentation. Um, how long it was going to be, who was on the team, what they were going to need to know, and then a very loose kind of Moscow voting system. And we all turned up four times a year for two and a half hours and went, yeah, okay, open a new tab, mic off, camera off. Boring. Yep, boring. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. It was really formal. So, I mean, if you're looking at it purely from a business perspective, you were going to say, yes, you're ticking the boxes. And we were all going, the boxes are shit. Sorry about the swearing. <laughs> and we were talking, what we found was we were talking to the people and nobody was offering anything back to us. Just, you know, a plus one in the chat with your mic and camera off. You know, that where, how are you supposed to plan properly if people are not talking back to you and giving you their honest opinion? Because I was hearing their honest opinions three and four weeks later when we were in the project, and somebody would say, I don't know, I don't think we should really have done this. And I'm like, well, where are you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, where were you four weeks ago? Oh, you were on a different tab, probably on Netflix. Anyway, next slide. This is gonna go fast, because we have a so, lot of pictures. <laughs> yeah, so I think this is my own. Yeah, so look, what were we going to do then? How are we going to change that formal, scripted kind of nature of the, of the planning process? Um, you know, it was all about engagement. So we needed engagement from the stakeholders, engagement from the team, um, you know, we needed to get those real insights from people. It was, it, we weren't getting anything when you look at a spreadsheet, like Aoife said, people tune out after five minutes and that was it, you got nothing. So, you know, we wanted to, to kind of bring this, give this a bit of personality is what it was. So it was all about that engagement, bring the personality in and make sure that we could kind of try and engage people in the way that they'd actually want to talk to us. So we iterated slowly because nobody likes change. 
Um, and we just played around with a couple of ideas of like adding a little bit of color to the spreadsheet because it was boring us to tears. Um, we were looking at maybe how could we get this, this whole process to be a bit more visual as well because a lot of people, like there's three kind of learning styles. There's the oral, visual, and kinesthetic. Most people learn with their eyes. You're going to look at something and say, whoa, I'm not going to do that. Or, wow, that looks really interesting. So we were trying to tr apply that to presenting project information to stakeholders and teams to see it, to visualize it, and to want to talk back to us about it. So we did this, and they didn't hate it. So we kind of went, all right, we could probably do a little bit more now that we haven't gotten a bad reaction from it. So do you just want to talk about that little the bit there, the stick man? Stick person. Stick person, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's a term um about what just how we added that and that was kind of like the first little thing we got a bit of a reaction from it and things like that yeah we could do it. like i mean yeah we we tried to show the people behind the work so we used stick people and that was good so people were like okay that takes three of the people rather than just the number three which you know it's, it's not going to weigh too much into you but i think as well what happened there was we actually had a lot of engagement with that just People started speaking about, oh, the stick people are there now. That's new. Yeah. Something new. So, yeah. So, we doubled down. Yep. So, I suppose, like I said, when I joined the team, I had some previous experience in another part of the organization where we kind of maybe used more of the open practice library. Uh, I don't know if people know that, but um, that's just a, basically a collection of really, you know, interesting agile techniques and processes. Um, so, we kind of went back to that and we had a look and we said, look, what is there something here that can help us with this? Um, and what we came across was an interesting idea called, it was originally called cover story. So it was to kind of lay out kind of, um, you know, information in a kind of a magazine type format where you would have, you know, a cover image, um, information about it and things like that. So we said, okay, that's, that's interesting. Let's see if we can adapt that a little bit to what we might need. So we kind of drew it up similar to this at the time. Um, you know, and we had a few basic requirements. We wanted, you know, we wanted to use something from the open practice library, like we said. We needed to use it online because all our team is pretty much remote. We were in the middle of the pandemic as well, so we couldn't come together anyway. So it had to be some sort of online whiteboarding solution or whatever it was. Uh, we needed the information to be all in one space. So you've seen the spreadsheets that were there earlier. You were brought off to other documents. You had to see many, many different things to be able to um, understand what the, what the basic idea was for the initiative we were looking at. And we were, just wanted a more dynamic and fresher approach to it, to try and get people engaged and make sure that they would be interested in actually working with us. So what we came up with was, I suppose, initiative stories, we call it. So we, we tweaked it slightly from what was there in, in the cover stories of Open Practice Library. Um, and maybe I'll just run through each section. So. We had a cover image, obviously, and this became quite important for us. And this is where the movie kind of concept came in. Um, we had like, you know, uh, coming to a screen near you, which was like an estimate. We had quotes from people, which were quite good as well. Brainstorming ideas. We had the big headlines, which is basically what are people saying about this initiative? What do they want to know about it? Um, the critic reviews then were from people in the team where they would basically add their commentary about what, this, what they knew about this initiative. Um, we had things like the cast, how many people would it take? We did credits then, which brought you to those other documents if you wanted to see them, but it was generally all contained on, on this screen. Um, and then probably the most important one there was we had a, a bottom line, we just call it. So from a stakeholder perspective, did they want this to proceed or not? Were they interested in actually doing it or not? So that was kind of the basic makeup of the, of the information we wanted to gather. And it looked like that. So a lot of color. Um, the team's stakeholders were presented with this top template first, and purely because uh, I think I think it was around Oscar season when we started this. But Stefan is into movies. A lot of the team were into movies, like Uma Thurman, and we thought it might be really fun to see what it would look like if we did the movie poster element. And we presented this to the team. It's a project. It's one of the projects that was in our quarterly planning. Um, but we have it as Kill Bill. It's actually that number, data grepper. It's it's two services, the database and a grep service. So like it has nothing to do with Kill Bill. But it was kind of funny to see it represented as such. And we just had our teams then fill out using stickies, and we had a lot of calls about it. We, we used to call we call them insight sessions. So they're calls that we set, facilitated calls that are optional. Um, but people do turn up because they wanted to see what the projects, what the movie posters for the projects were. And it was a great springboard into, oh, I've never seen that movie before. And somebody else would pipe up and say, you've never seen that movie before? 
And it would just spiral off like that. And it's very easy then once the conversation starts to kind of guide it back into, well, put it on your watch list. But like, have you any experience in data grepper? Can you tell me a bit more about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I use that for blah, blah, blah. And we already were getting these organic conversations very easily just by giving something to talk about. So yeah, it was a lot more colorful. So I mentioned about the insights and you saw Uma Thurman, but she only represented one project. And when you're doing a prioritization call, a quarterly planning, you're usually talking about a lot of different work packets that you can choose from. So we did movie posters for all of the projects that we were going to choose from that quarter. We had Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We had Jurassic Park for a PDC application. I'm not sure does anybody know what that is, but when we were <laughs> when we were talking about what ones and the guys like it's a jungle app, I was like, well, it's going to have to be Jurassic Park then for that one. So it was just refreshing to have these colors, these posters instead of spreadsheets. And the spreadsheets are all linked down here in the credits because they are still important. There are you do need to have a source of your information. We're trying to contain as much as we can on the boards. But if you do need further reading, we wanted to make, sh that, make sure that was accessible for you as well. So yeah, like, like we said, you know, we got, it's visual and eye-catching. We were getting the conversation started. People wanted to offer their opinions this time rather than checking out for an hour to catch up on other work or emails. And we got a lot of in-depth analysis from the applications because there was people who either knew about it and willing to share and people who didn't know about the project who would be then working on it and was able to learn from first-hand people who may not have been. So we were kind of, we were already winning before we even got into the deciding call. Yeah, so I suppose we had all this information. How can we make some decisions based on it? So we have limited, resor limited resources in the team. Um, you know, we have five or six projects that come up every quarter. We might be able to do two, two or three of them maybe. Um, so what do we do? How do we make these decisions? So previously we had kind of tried different voting kind of mechanisms, Moscow voting, things like this, but we had our stakeholders, which basically, um, you know, were, were letting us know what they were interested in. But I suppose for that, we, we found that we didn't get a great response. A lot of the response was, I don't really care. Um, so how do we prioritize that? So that was difficult. So we said, and we look back at the um, the open practice library again, and another technique that I'd used on a few other engagements previously. And one of the main things as well was we, we did not want to be the drivers of this discussion. We just wanted to facilitate it, but we didn't want, we found that we were talking the whole time. We were kind of making decisions also, almost. We wanted those decisions to come from the stakeholders instead, so that we were clear on what we, need, what we needed to work on. So yeah, back to the open practice library again. Um, this technique, very simple technique, uh, priority sliders it's called. Um, and basically, you know, each project or initiative that we had can only have one kind of score on this north to five scale that we've got here. So, you know, every stakeholder had to kind of discuss, we went through and we discussed each initiative. Okay, so where do you think that this should, should belong? Is it a two, is it a three, is it a four, is it a five, where, where's it go? And the stakeholders then started actually discussing amongst themselves, I think this is a one for this reason, I think this is a two, whatever it was. So we had some really good engagement, some good discussion actually happened and we just faded into the background more than anything and just said, okay guys, we just used terms like when, when people were um, saying, oh, I think that's a one, we say, well, can you explain that? Explain that to the rest of the group so we can understand what you mean. Um, so yeah, so, you know, I've used this technique before on a few engagements, like I said. Um, it gets to unan an unanimous agreement at the end of the plan. Um, and also, it shows where people have to make compromises as well, based upon resources that are available. So I think it's, it's a really good technique to use if you have any type of um, contentious decisions or whatever amongst stakeholder groups, where you can, you can really easily and visually put it out like this and, um, you know, get the conversation going. So that's that's kind of what we did for that in terms of um, yeah getting the, the results that we needed in a non-confrontational way. So we had done our insight sessions. We'd gathered all the information about the projects, these really heavy technical projects that I, as somebody who sits in this weird gray area of not an engineer, not a manager, but still responsible for kind of both sometimes, um, it was great to be able to get the information all from the team and the stakeholders and then, then be able to circulate it back out before we went into this decision. And to be honest, 
because I'm in those conversations from, from the get-go, from about two weeks before we decide on the work plan, I already nearly know what, what's going to happen because people have been so forthcoming in those calls because they're in a call where they feel safe and they're comfortable. It's not recorded, but like it is facilitated, so the commentary is, is scribed. But because it's not recorded, people are a little bit freer with their discussion and they feel safer to do so, and they can challenge opinions respectfully <laughs> so most of the time. <laughs> it only happened once that it didn't. Um, <laughs> You know the call I was talking about. <laughs> but they were able to do that and it still didn't derail conversations and we still had all of this wonderful insights about the projects that we didn't have in those documents beforehand. So we put it all together, we send it out, we send the summary email, we're capturing the perspectives coming up to the call. Then we have that call that Steph has mentioned that we use the priority sliders where we discuss and rank the projects and see this is what it looks like. This is your one to five wish list. We can do one to three. What does that look like for you? And everybody was, everybody felt like they had had their fair say. And then we landed on the result and we were able to say, okay, done. We have our next quarter planned. And then it gets sent out again. So I hate emails. I absolutely hate them. I'd rather get on a call with a hundred people and tell us something in five minutes, but they are a necessary evil, evil because time zones. So the information is important to get back out. And we were able to do that quite easily. And certainly, like I said, from somebody who doesn't come from a technical background, I was able to give the right level of information to the stakeholders before and after the prioritization call. And I think just looking at the screen as well, you can see all the information is contained there. When we had those calls, we could easily flick back to any of the any of the initiatives, talk about, you know, particular issues with them or particular um, things that we wanted to dive into a bit more and just keep flicking back and forth to make those decisions on the prioritization call. So the vast, vast majority of the information was contained on the one board. We didn't really need to go anywhere else to have those discussions or, or make those decisions. So that was a big part of it. So they loved us. They really loved us. <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple of um, a couple of nice commentary back from our main stakeholders. Matthew was one of them, um, but yeah, it, everybody felt like it was it was a really nice way to approach quarterly planning because those those of you who are in teams that do it, you probably have felt the boredom kick in after twenty minutes of looking at a spreadsheet and a document. We were able to do our quarterly planning calls in forty five minutes was our best record because we had these really comfortable, engaging, useful conversations coming up to it. Um, what I did like on, I think it was Bex, he got a movie list watch out of it. So <laughs> he has now a list of movies that he got, he now has to watch, which he felt was great. Um, from stakeholders of our team who are not part of our team, but close enough for, into our team that we see every day, they felt like they were becoming part of it, that they had gained friends from it. So, I mean, if you, if you work with people who you consider friends, are you really working? And it was, it was what we were trying to get. We were trying to get this really comfortable, useful conversation coming into our quarterly planning session so we could then decide on the best pieces of work that we should devote time, engineering time, people time to. And it would generate the most value for our stakeholders. So, but we did it in a kind of a nicer way. Did Matthew Miller, Miller actually say that? <laughs> there you go, he did. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, look, and, and that was the basic principle behind it. We've just gone through it super quick there because we only had 20 minutes. This talk we've given for an hour before. But um, yeah, so look, I think that's it. That's the end. We've keep we've right on time, I think. So that's good. So uh, roll the credits. <laughs> yeah, Steph wanted to take it. I was like, no, this is Maybe. the venue for Monty Python. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a few minutes for questions. Hey, great talk, lads. Um, yeah, I, I, that's really interesting. And and I'm involved a lot in continuous planning as part of a different engineering section. So some really interesting stuff in this. Two quick questions. Uh, for the priority sliders, if you have different stakeholders with different requirements, you have product security coming in with something compliance SML, you have QE coming in, you have PM coming in, engineering coming in, whose decision, if they do not come to unanimous decision on the priority for a specific piece of work, who it makes that ultimate decision on where that lands? So look, they should make the decision. 
that yeah. that's who that's that's what we were trying to teach our stakeholders as well that you know they have to make the decisions themselves we're a team that can support the decisions that they make 100%. but they need to make the decisions themselves they're they're compete there's there's always going to be competing uh, you know priorities for everyone but what we found previously was we were making the decisions like i said we would yeah, just yeah, say yeah. oh okay so look it do, looks like you want to do that so we just do it but what we found over time a little bit was and this didn't just happen overnight either, either. this whole process was probably about 6 months um, you know, from when we started it to when we rolled it out. Um, so what I'd say is the... Oh, I set the alarm. Time's up. Uh, so what I'd say is it's more about teaching the stakeholders that they will have to compromise, they will have to make the decisions themselves, and it will be all in their best interest to do that. I agree. So have you, you've never had a scenario where there's been just pure disagreement on the priority of a specific no, item? No, not really. I'm like to <laughs> double down on what, what Steph means is that the idea of the priority sliders call is that all stakeholders are present and they, yeah, they yeah. have to listen to every each perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea would be that if there's vastly competing priority or priorities or requirements, by the time ProdSec has had their say as to why this is more important, if it truly is actually more important to the entire project, the other stakeholders should should understand where they're coming from and maybe change their decision. It's about influencing other people's decisions. And okay. you kind of keep going until mm. everyone feels unanimous on it. And I, and I suppose what it was as well was you then see people like, so someone might say, okay, this is the most important priority now, and they might get that. And then you see them compromising a little bit on the second and the third and yeah, all that. Yeah, so yeah. you, you kind of do get a, a fairly good feel for what's going on. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I do not have time. I'll, I'll give it. I want to ask my second question, but yeah, great talk. I think being able to uh, bring people together in that way using planning is pretty awesome. So, thanks. Go easy now, Carson. Um, okay. Um, the yeah, actually, that was really interesting. That what you just described was a consensus decision-making model where you drive towards solving people's problems instead of getting a 51, 49% vote thing, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, um, the question I wanted to ask was about the, the evolution of the, the, the display. Did you reach a point where it got, did you do anything that was too much visually? People on the team that said, was there anybody who had you know, color blindness or other elements that made it, or, or had a hard time parsing that much visual information and it got to be a little overwhelming? Were there any that come at all and do you have to make any adjustments? That's actually a really good, um, a really good comment. To be honest, nobody has said they were colorblind to us, but I never even thought of it. No, I didn't think of it either. Um, but yeah, no, I did get, I did get a bit of feedback on the side, um, not in, not in any confrontational way of just like, geez, if there's too much color in that thing, I can't look at it. <laughs> like, well, don't, don't look at it. Just come on the call. Just like share your your thoughts. You don't have to interact with Miro. There was one guy who said every time I log on to the thing, my laptop. Is going to explode. I was like, okay, just join the call. Just be part of the conversation. I don't need you to put your thoughts on a sticky. That's why it's a facilitated call. I'll do that. I'm listening to all of the conversation. I'm I'm catching those commentary as and when they come up. So if you're not comfortable logging into Miro because your laptop's going to blow up, if you're not comfortable looking at the screen, just just stop by and listen and be a participant. So that's um, yes, that did happen, but it didn't actually harm what we wanted out of it in the finish. Uh, and look, it was all about engagement, getting people engaged to join the call, to speak, to do it instead of just sitting there. So that's pretty much what it was. If you are a project manager or product owner that hasn't as a lot of experience with uh, software engineering and you're tasked with trying to plan software technical work, I highly recommend that you find a really neutral way to like engage with your team because trying to meet them down at the code level it's not going to work for you, and they are not going to be able to explain things to you on a one-to-one -one basis very well. You're better off with a semi-big, comfortable space where everybody can just join in and converse. When you were talking about movies like Kill Bill and um, Jurassic Park and things like that, you said that they were good conversation starters. Did you actually use that? movie metaphor for you know the movie you chose in other ways like drawing parallels with the project beyond the yeah, yeah I, I think you made to, yeah. yeah you made a little joke about <laughs> Jurassic Park but yeah. um I, I think we had a little bit of fun coming up. Yeah. So we looked at the project briefs and we seen you know what 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 they were entailing and, and some of the projects we didn't even know what they were. And sometimes it was just a, a name I think it was one called RPM Auto Spec. Yeah. And we used like 
the Fast and the Furious and things like that. So it was just we just kind of made connections like that. Cars. Yeah. So we just made connections like that. And then sometimes we did. Sometimes there was, you know, maybe people added a few, you know, a few wisecracks or a few jokes about the movie representing the 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 actual project in the end, you know, or or, or, or appearing like it did. So we didn't put loads into it, but you could do a whole thing with that as well. You could do a whole thing with ask the team, you know, what movie this would be representative of and things like that. But yeah. It gets a bit tricky trying to match software projects with movies. Yeah. Just try and Google a, a few <laughs> a few movies. Movies about replacing Fedora messaging systems. It not a lot comes back off that Google search. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I did. I did go and toy with that one. <laughs> How can we get these pretty graphics and fun movie things into the CPE quarterly report or something like that that gets published for the community because yeah. it's long and uh, not exciting, even though there's exciting stuff going on? We no are question. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good point. I'm pleased to say we are working on infographics rather than the weekly text report to go out. I think Michael Conecci is actually spearheading that. So you will definitely see more infographics from our team. But yeah, we it's to be honest with you, it's just a miss on my part to actually put it through. Um we use a tool called Miro, which is an enterprise tool, so it's not open source, but we have put one or two of the pictures of the discussion up on I think it's on my Fedora uh, Fedora People page. So it's just a matter of like tidying up on our end to make sure that the information is not just within our team and stakeholders, but gets back out to the upstream as well. I've made a mental note to remind myself. <laughs> hey, last question. Uh, do you have a link to the Miro template that other teams could potentially use all of this great stuff? Yep, we we do. So there's there's a blank one up there, so we can we can share that around later. Unfortunately, it's probably contained within the Red Hat space only. Yeah. Okay. So we could potentially publish it. I just have to figure out how to publish it as a template in Miro. I think they have to accept it and things like that. So hundred percent. And yeah. some some supporting document work obviously, but some supporting documentation would be really useful for. This is a big company, and I think a lot of other people could make good use from this. We we did also have a write up on um, opensource.com. Um, so a blog post there, we did a four, four kind of um, series of it. I think the third or fourth one is out at the moment. Um, so we'll, we'll drop a link to that as well in, That's in awesome. the presentation. And that, that explains a lot of the background. It goes into more detail than what we, what we said here today as well. Also on your movie stubs, um, the QR code will bring you to the openpracticelibrary.com um, link. All of the concepts that we took for our planning process, we took from Open Source Library, which is free. Um, it's completely like go you can even put in your own templates as well we probably could do that with this one but yeah feel free to scan it and there's loads of resources if you're trying to just better your planning uh, planning processes and team norms and all that all that kind of boring admin but could do it really fun way so i would highly recommend using this resource it's excellent i think that's it thanks a lot everyone Also, don't forget to pick up your party tickets from the registration desk.
Um, are they doing any like the not to clip on? Yeah, they have some Oh, I was, it was just because I, I walk a little bit, and but it's like okay. And so this one's gonna be on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, let's welcome Kelly um, for our next talk around community data. Awesome. <laughs> can okay? It's can people hear me? I don't have no idea. No, really. Um, let's see. I can just okay. I can also just like talk loudly. I'm good at that. Um, so hi, my name is Callie Dolphy, and I am a data scientist at in the open source program office at Red Hat. Um, and today we're going to be talking about community metrics and starting to make decisions around what we want to measure and why we want to measure them. So let's break down a little bit what we'll be discussing today. So first, we're going to be starting at the value of community metrics. Why do we want to do this? And then the methodology behind generating community metrics, and then going into the analysis um, lessons learned. This third one is really where what I hope for y'all to leave with and the type of things you want to think about as you go forward and do your own community analysis. So first question here is why do we even want to do community metrics? Why do we want to spend time doing that? And first, I'm not going to tell you that data analysis and automation is going to be the one thing that informs your community decisions. It's actually the opposite. This is to build off of your own open source community knowledge, incorporate others, and uncover potential biases or perspectives not like already considered. You can think about some of your colleagues that might have a specialization, really understand how community meetups work and the impacts that can come here. Or maybe somebody else is really great with PRs and understanding what balance needs to come there to be helpful towards the community. Those type of specialties can be integrated into your visualization so everyone can benefit from that type of knowledge. And so the next thing is, is that we all have a thousand and one things to keep up with. And it always feels like there is never enough time. There's never, there's always one more email. And if getting an answer about your community is going to take 10, 15 hours, you're not going to do it multiple times, if at all once, is really going to be getting there. So how can we start making this to be a regular process and a realistic process? And also, there's just so much data available, and there's such a pressure to take, okay, I have so much repository data, I have IRC data, I have all this stuff, and wanting the pressure to use it all and really capitalize on it. So how do we go through with just all the piles of data and pick out the little pieces that can actually bring you insights and be helpful towards your everyday work with your community? So first, we're going to start thinking about what perspective you want to gain from your analysis. Um, and what do you want to receive? What do you want to give? And there's a few things you want to consider. First, is your main goal to gain information or influence an action that will be made? Is there an area of your community that is not understood? Or are you trying to take a first, uh, are you trying to take that first step of getting to understand that? Or are you starting to try to influence some actions? Is there an initiative that you want to establish? Is there a new meetup? Is there a new processes that you want to do? And trying to measure that initiative that's already in place. Another thing you want to consider is, are you wanting to expose an area for improvement or trying to highlight strengths? There are going to be times when you're just trying to hype up your community and show how great it is. This can be to show business impact, advocate for your community, all of the above. But when it comes to informing yourself about and your community about things that you might want to change or improve on, just focusing in on the things that you're best at is not going to get you any farther than you already are. And identifying these sh shortcomings is where you can go and see most of the value from your metrics. There is not a problem with highlighting strengths. There's actually a great time and place from it. 
but you don't want to just have a yes man to just tell you how great your community is and stay stagnant and never change. But you may want to show this for outsiders or use this to boost morale and really highlight some community members that have been doing awesome work. There's just a balance and really what comes from this is determining what that perspective is for you can keep that separated. Lastly, you want to consider whether you're looking for community impact or business impact. The languages that many businesses speak in is numbers and data. That can make it incredibly, it can make it incredibly difficult for you to advocate for your community and have people listen to you. And this can be a way to speak the language that they are used to seeing. Putting some weight behind your words, the language and the message that you're getting across might never change from the analysis that you're showing, but you're putting weight to try to get people to hear you. And, or like I said, that's the business side of it. You might want to just be looking at your community impacts. How is it impacting the open source ecosystem as a whole? Um, how is your community impacting the people inside of it? Those are some of the things you want to consider. And these are not always like an either or situation, but the framing of it makes it to be where it's a more deliberate metric and where you can hone in on what your actual goal is. Anything you get beyond that is just a plus. So. Um, when talking about general data science or machine word, um, learning work, you're going to see some version of this workflow. And so we're going to kind of take a step back to look at the problem of open source community analysis from the lens of data science analysis as a whole. Um, and we're going to be focusing in on this very first step, the codifying problems and metrics. And we'll be looking at a splash of second, but mainly this first one. Um, and this entire presentation can actually be viewed as a case study of this first step. And this step is often overlooked. If you've talked to me, you know that I will hype on this often, that everyone wants to go to all of the fancy feature engineering, the model validation, all of the big fancy words and tooling, and not actually focusing in on the thing that you want to get out of this. What questions are you trying to answer? And so, you just don't wake up one day and be like, I know exactly what I look at, I want to look into, and I know that this is realistic. It's not really how that works. So we really want to focus in on this codifying problems and metrics. And so now we're going to hone into our goal of our time here. And surprise, it's codifying problems and metrics. The tooling debate is one for another time. This is one that I will always talk about. If you want to have this debate, come find me afterwards and we can argue which debate, which tool is better. Um, we're going to start with truly figuring out what we want to know, looking at what data that we have, and take us to the goal of thoughtful execution of data analysis. So we're going to go into some different analysis angles, and these are not the only ones. They're just the main examples for this talk, but they can be generally applied throughout. So let's look at our first scenario here. This is current data analysis. Say you've kind of already started to go down this path, you've gotten your data, you know what you're looking, what you generally want to look into, and now want to start making it better. The idea here is to build off of the common traditional open source community analysis. Commits over time is cool, but what does that actually tell you besides a straight up value? We can start taking increment steps of just having a value to having insights. So Let's first look at number of contributors over time. Say at this point, you know that there has been 150 people who have contributed to in your community at some point. Okay, that's a great number. You can put it on a slide, but you're not going to change any actions within your own community on it. So why don't we take it a step further and look at active versus drifting contributors? Um, out of those 150, how many of them have actively committed in the last three months? Has that value changed significantly in the, la like in the last period of time? Maybe a year ago, about 50% of those people were actively contributing versus now maybe only 10%. What is causing that decrease? And we can look at it by repeat or flyby contributors. So when you have that person come in and do that very first contribution, how many of them are actually becoming active contributors in your community and staying around? Another example we can look at this is commits over time. Say this month we have had 100 commits and this next month we see that there's 40. Those are units, great for a presentation, but you're not gonna change your decisions. And so what about looking at the depths of your commits? So say those 100 commits, there was maybe a single line of code changed or a period in documentation was switched out 
versus maybe in those 40, there was a huge refactor in the code base. Um, an entire, there was hundreds and thousands of lines of codes moved around. Those are two very different scenarios that you would not get from just a straight 100 commits versus 40 commits. Another way of looking into this is commits by a subset of your contributors. Is there a part of your code base that is heavily dependent on one, two, three people? Is that manageable? And how vulnerable are you if something happens and one of those contributors can no longer contribute to your community? And so now we'll go into the second scenario, which is community campaign impact measurement. That's a lot of words. Let's figure out what that actually means. Let's think meetup, conferences, or a community initiative. How do you start to view the impacts of those goals? And there's two steps to this, and they actually figure, they actually feed into one another. Once you establish your campaign goals, you can go from there to determine what can be measured to detect the impact of these actions. It's really easy to fall into the trap of being a little hand wavy and non-concrete with your goals when the campaign comes up and at the end of it kind of feeling a little bit empty and not really knowing what happened with those actions and that effort. Did something actually come out of it? Um, and one example here that I think really shows this scenario is some work that I've been doing with the Fedora community. They had came and mentioned a goal of doubling the con contributors by 2025. That seems like a pretty simple, straightforward question. But what are we considering a contribution? Is it just code? Is it documentation? Is it um, working on the website, doing designs? Where do those contributions need to happen to count? And so those, it might seem so simple in that one sentence, but there's really a lot of dynamic to it. And once you determine what those, where you want to look, what counts, then you can actually change the campaign and how you go about implementing your goals and what are you going to put your effort into. And so, yeah, we can go into our third scenario here. And we're going to spend the majority of our time here as the prior examples can be viewed as different parts of this workflow. This is a living cycle and improvements or extensions can always be made. You have to kind of determine if it's worth that time to continue putting into it, but it's something that you must consider. I don't know about y'all, but I'm more of an examples person. We will walk through these steps at a theoretical level and then go into an in-depth example. So this first step here is breaking down your focus area and taking in those perspectives that we discussed in the earlier slides. I like to think about this in a three-part process. First, let's think about a magic eight ball. You know that toy that I think a lot of us had as a kid where you could go and ask it any question. Maybe my question today is, is the green line running? And, most like, and it's probably gonna say definitely not, but I probably could look out the window and tell you that for myself, but you get the point. So let's think about your analysis area. If you could get any answer right away, no, like no limitations, what would it be? You have that hierarching goal. Now we can look into the data that is available. When you look at this focus area in that magic eight ball question, what are the data sources that you have available to you that could have anything to do potentially with the question or more generally that focus area? Now that we have the data, we have our goals, what questions could be actually answered with the data that you have to bring you closer to that magic eight ball question? You can start taking and breaking it down into subcomponents that's actually realistic with the, with the data that you have. One thing to note here is that it might seem tempting to be like, okay, I have four different subparts of this question. Let's bring it all together and it's going to give me the exact answer that I want from that big overarching. That can start to build on top of a lot of assumptions if you try to bring it together like that. So you really have to be careful with it, but those sub questions is still going to bring you closer to what you wanted to learn in the first place. So now we're going to go into that second step of converting those sub questions into a metric. And this is a process that you would repeat every single time for those sub, those sub parts determined in step one. So taking one of those sub questions, we want to first select those specific data points needed. Maybe originally you said, okay, GitHub data. Do you want to look at issues? Are you trying to look at contributors? What is really honing into the specific data points that you're going to be using? 
Next, you're going to want to look into what visualization is actually going to give you the information you want here. Is it a heat map? Is it actually just one metric point? Do you need to do some form of like linear regression, whatever that might be? You have to kind of spend some time being like, okay, I have my data. I have my question. What is the tool that's going to get me there? And then the next step with this is starting to hypothesize and look into what the impacts of this information might be. What are some insights maybe is like, what is your goal here? And that can feed into the next portion of this process. So now that you have your initial work in progress metric, this is, in my opinion, where the real magic happens. And this is where you have the collaboratory person um, portion. And this is when you want to bring in your biggest skeptic, the person who is going to try to break down and tell you every single reason why you're wrong in a constructive manner, but still trying to tell, ask all of the questions for you can start to iterate on the first thing that you developed. Many times the best ideas from my work that I've done here has come from bringing forth a singular visualization or an idea that I have, and that person has taken it in a direction I had never thought of before. Multiple different conferences I've been to, I have left being really excited because of the advancements that happened just by having new eyes on the work that I had been doing. So this third step now is taking this analysis to go into action. So we have three different steps on things that can happen here with every cycle of this, sometimes you'll definitely be doing the, the alignment with prior knowledge, but these second two steps, you'll kind of have to see what you want to do with this. So first, you want to see if your metric follows what is currently known about your community. So in the scenario that it does align, is there some assumptions that you've made to cater the results? You want to take a little bit of a step there to make sure that you didn't honestly put into the assumptions that you wanted to see and it outputted with the data. And if it does not, investigate a little bit further. Is there a data or calculation issue? If not, is this just something you've discovered to be a priorly misunderstood part of your community and something that you can build off from there? And then once you have a better understanding of how this aligns with your prior knowledge, community initiatives can now be imp imp Im implemented. Um, and these, these community initiatives should be informed by data analysis. And we want to gear them towards being measurable where we can see what those impacts come. And so once we get to the point of observing these initiatives, we want to see, okay, when we're looking at these metrics or the things that we thought we we're gonna be looking at, are we measuring the right thing? If you don't see the results or you're not seeing a real change in the activity, is there an impact happening? And maybe you're looking in a different space. Maybe you expected to see it in the commits and it's actually around the activity in your IRC channel. There's more people asking questions, more people getting involved. Or is the initiative, does the initiative strategy need to change? You thought that something would have an impact in a way and it didn't. And you kind of need to tweak what you had thought to be doing before. So I'm going to get a quick drink and we can go into an example all of the words that I had just said. <laughs> so let's look at this concrete example. Let's say I want to analyze new contributors for the first time. So I go with my magic eight ball and I figure out what I want to ask. What do I wish I knew if I could just get a straight answer? And with this one, I'm go I want to know if people are having an experience that converts them to become a consistent contributor. That's my overarching goal and the question I'd like to have answered. Next, what data do I have that can go towards this analysis area and the magic eight ball question? And this is gonna, for me in this case, it's going to be an individual contributor activity. And so now that we have our individual contributor activity on repos and getting those timestamps. And now that you have the data and the magic eight ball question, Let's break this down into subparts and see them all the way to the end. If you're thinking about this in the prior steps that we went through, we're gonna take three sub questions from that first step and bring them all the way to analysis and action. So this first sub question that I would come up with is, how are people coming into our community? Looking at new contributors, let's see what the first action that they do. So from a data perspective, we're gonna look at contributions, whether that be issues, PRs, commits, whatever that may be, by the contributions over time. And we're only looking at the very first one that they're doing. 
And then we're going to be looking at the visualization. The visualization I want to see here is the first time contributions broke, broken down by quarter. And so once I have this visualization, and I will show an example of this at the end, um, now I'm going to talk to some people and try to see what we can learn further. How can we take this farther? And let's see from this, we can see that maybe we want to break down whether that first contribution would like be a signal of the person staying and being an active member of the community. Is a PR a better sign or is an issue? And as a community, are we supporting our new contributors to be able to do a PR? Are we labeling first new issues well? Is that something that you want to add to your new contributor documentation? Maybe getting that first PR merge is very overwhelming and having a PR buddy of some sort might help, might help them figure out through those steps as well as having a connection point within a community. And so this is kind of that first sub question all the way into an actual action. Another example of this is what is the conversion rate from a first time contributor to an active or a repeat contributor? And this is going to be looking at the same data as we were before. And I want to look at a metric of the percent or number that was converted to an active contributor versus not. And some questions and actions that could come from this is looking at, is this number or percent going down? Is there something that we were doing differently in the past that helps support people to become active contributors that we need to start doing again? Or where is that change coming from? And then we can also look at, is there some trends of the ones that are staying around? Are they getting more direct communications from other active members? Is there issues getting comments or their PRs getting more activity than they were before? So now with all of this, we're going to go into our analysis lessons learned and the things that I really want you to leave today with. So metrics, they do have limitations, but there's a lot of opportunities that can come with it. Numbers and data analysis are not facts. You can make them say anything you want, and your internal skeptic needs to be alive and well. The iterative process of really breaking down what you've made and trying to build off of it is what's going to bring you value. You don't want your analysis to just be a yes man of the things that you've already known. You want to take time to take a step back and evaluate the assumptions that you have made. Also, if a metric just points you to a new direction to investigate, that's a huge win. You can't think and look into everything right off the bat with no, with no kind of triggers. When you get sent down a rabbit hole, that can be a really great thing for your community. That one email that you didn't get to is not that big of a deal. Um, and that can be a conversation starter that brings you to a new place. And sometimes exactly what you want to measure is not there but you might be able to get valuable pieces of the puzzle. With that, you can't just assume that you have all of the pieces put together. If you try to force an answer or solution like that really pesky puzzle where you think this should fit and it just doesn't, you can lead yourself down a dangerous path by assumptions. Leaving room for the goal or analysis to change can lead you to a better place than where you were before. And next, the analysis, this is the start. Each scenario that we went through today is starting at different points of the analysis process. If we look at that first example, that's the second go around of your data analysis where you're starting to build. The second example of looking at your community initiatives, your goals and scope have been, you have been established. Now you're trying to observe your initiatives and loop back around and seeing what you can change. And that third one is a new idea, just building straight from scratch. You should never stop asking yourself if more context is needed or if you're truly answering the questions that you want. And there's so much going on, whether that be data, other community responsibilities. If we can cut down the amount of time it takes to get this information and make it to an easy check at a, a regular cadence, that's a huge win. Think about how much we can use this information to guide ourselves in the way you think about your community, even if it's not in a direct application that you have thought about. You want to make this process sustainable. And if it takes only five or 10 minutes a week to check into something, that's much more realistic than the 10 or 15 hours that we were starting with before. So now I'm going to leave you with my closing thoughts. And that's data is a tool, but it's not the answer. It can bring together analysis and information that would not have been accessible otherwise. 
And the methodology is vital to the success and the value of your analysis. You need to get comfortable with the process of breaking down what you want to know into manageable chunks and then building off of that. And taking a step back, open source data analysis is a great example of the care that needs to be taken with all data science work. You must take into account the nuance of the topic area. And as we all know, open source community is about as nuanced as it is. The process of working through what to ask and answer is often overlooked in every application of data science. And it can be the hardest part to come up with that knowing what to ask and building off that to make something insightful and innovative. But the time spent there is much more important than whatever tool you choose to use. So if you're a community member with no data science experience, just looking for a place to start, I hope this can show you how important and valuable you can be to this process. You bring the insights and the understanding of the data and the needs of your community. And I hope you can see the places where you can fit into this process without touching any data or line of code. And if you are a data scientist or somebody implementing the metrics or visualizations, you have to listen to the voices around you and other people in your community, even if you're also actively involved in that community. And that is what I got for y'all. I will show some of the um, visualizations that I was referencing to earlier and leave room for questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. They're highly specific. <laughs> That's so fun. You can come up and talk to me afterwards. It's also like 4 p.m. on a Friday. I understand that people are mentally dead. So I know I am. <laughs> but yeah, if anybody would like the links to like seeing this analysis in action and looking at your own communities, this is also available um, through Project San Diego, and I can provide the link as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, great talk. Thank you. Um, I don't know how much you're going to be able to answer this right now, but if I want to get into it, do you have like RSS feeds I should follow to like read up and maybe get it into my life more? Because this is really exciting and I never get to it. <laughs> yes. Um, I would say that the first steps that I would follow would be like kind of following the prescribed route of like determining what you want to ask and what data is necessary to do that. And then from there, it's actually a project that we're building on now of how to get from those questions to actually seeing that analysis without having as much of a barrier of knowing all the data science work on the background. So my initial would be get to that point of the question, knowing what data you need and reach out to me or hopefully in the next couple of months, this will be a little bit more streamlined and I can reach out and give more information about the project that we have going. Right, last one. Hi, yes. Uh, so you mentioned uh, turning your uh, the metrics that you collect into uh, action uh, actionable uh, uh, insights. How do you avoid uh, the uh, turning those actions into yes man questions uh, once you've gathered uh, metrics on what it is you want to do? So I would say that you wanted to start like where your baseline is. So if you're looking, if you're trying to change like how many contributors are in your community, you want to look at the baseline of what it looks like before that initiative has started. And then if you start to look at the data and you start to see a trend upwards, you could you want to also take into account, okay, we have established this initiative. Is there anything else going on that might be impacting this as well? And kind of take that into account. But it's really important to have that baseline and knowing where your community was at before you started implementing your initiative. <laughs> to make sure there's nothing else weird going on. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is the lightning talk.
and don't forget to pick up your party ticket from the registration desk. Thank you. Yes. Pretty much what the example I was talking about is like, okay, we really need to break down where, okay, what is a contribution? And I think Fedora is a little bit, it's a good example of it, it's a lot more complicated because it's like, you don't want to just look at certain repositories, but it's also like for the repositories, which ones matter. And, and, and so, and then whenever it comes to stuff involving like design or website, like where can we see that activity? And so I think we have a really great opportunity here, but that's the first step where we can actually get a list of those and we can start going one by one being like, okay, this is how we can look at this. This is how we can look at this and this is how we can go there. Yeah, for like for what I'm going for, so like I want it as broad as possible. Like I, someone's just hanging out on IRC all day and not even yeah being there and you know interacting. Like that yeah. counts to me. Right. Exactly. So, and so then it's like, okay, which are IRC yeah, channels right. and getting those links? Because I think that we can get like a chart, like a, pretty much a document going of being like, okay, here's the repos that matters. Here is with links, the um, IRC chats that matters here, the web, like, like kind of like, not only like what, but where and having those links, then we can really start moving. Okay. And I, there's probably some more work on what exact quest, other questions we want to answer that would be good to like, have some space to yeah, because I think that if we can, because I would say that's good to be working on in the background, but if I would really want us to start, because if we can figure out where to go measure, going from, okay, we want to look at doubling contributors versus like looking at something else yeah, is so much, your, it's so your, easy. Your newcomer example is good, because I think we need to work on our, like, I often see people showing up in various places, and I want to get help yes. in various ways, and it would be like, it would be nice, if, I mean, it could be anybody's first message, but maybe even if you could specifically like, identify messages that are like, how do I get involved, how do I contribute, and like, mm -hmm. find those kind of messages, and then... I'm getting booted. Is it going to be a turf war? It is. I need a standoff. You're waiting to talk, man. I need, I, need to, I need Tommy's um, <laughs> tumbleweed-themed um, exactly. presentation. All right, I'm just taking the earpiece off. All right, y'all here for lightning talks? Do we have more people for lightning talks? Uh, let's see. I saw it fly in a room. All right, so the way we're going to do this is we are going to go in order of uh, popularity of vote. Um, and we'll see how many we can get to in the amount of time we have. Then we will immediately be following uh, with egg karaoke. So right after this. You want to stay? It'll be fun. Uh, we're kind of thinking like five or six minutes, like five to seven minutes. Um, so maybe, you know, shoot for five minutes and then maybe you can take a question. Does that work? <laughs> All right, let me make sure the stick mic works. Test, test. Test. All right, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Dawson, I think you are first. I'm pulling them up right now, yeah. Um, yeah, either one. Yes, we would spell fire. Uh, sorry, the, the carefully manufactured link process that I did, did not actually work. Um, one sec. No, 
No, it's 36, though. Right? 36 is current? I can never remember. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right. Did anybody else send me links to wherever their talks are for the lightning talks? So I was going to try to run them all off of here because that will be way less painful than switching computers. Um, so you can either do that or you can just type it in when you get here. Whatever you prefer. All right. And I don't know, probably you want ODP or PDF? It doesn't matter to me. All right, let's do ODP. It's probably easier. <laughs> exactly. We're going to do WordStar. I keep computer something wrong. So. Okay. Sorry, Peter was on the wrong side, which kept confusing me. Fairly monitor. There's also a fly that is driving me nuts. All right. Does, is there like a present mode in Firefox though? Or do I have to do? Well, yeah, but will it do it as pages? No. Print it? I'll hand them out. Eh, whatever. Yeah, right. Exactly. That works. All right. Uh, I'm going to stick with the stick mic. You will use the podium mic. Take it away. Uh, there will be a hook if you run too long. Uh, this is Troy Dawson with his open source shirts talk. Uh, and here we go. How do you open source a shirt? Uh, I've always loved Hawaiian shirts. Here I am at 20, 30, 40, and 50, all wearing Hawaii shirts. I love Hawaiian shirts. I love penguins and Linux. Uh, that penguin is on the, that's a vector based, has the Creative Commons attributions license, which means I can use it as long as I give attribution. And so what I did was gave it a Hawaiian shirt. And I kept the same license, Hawaiian uh, Creative Commons attributions. And then I made more penguins with Hawaiian shirts. And then, of course, you've got to give color variations. And that's, there, there we go. You have to have color variations of all the penguins wearing Hawaiian shirts. Now, uh, I have a brother that actually was making Hawaiian shirts. And his graphics artist was nice enough to create this graphics artist. And so he gave me, he made me a Hawaiian shirt. There we go. Not only am I here with this, I'm showing you my dirty laundry. Um, <laughs> this is not that shirt because that one is uh, like 10 years, eight years old and it's faded. And this is, I, I remade it. So. There's a Hawaiian shirt. And that got me thinking. You know, he made it for me. I was like, well, wait a sec. What if whoop, I started making my own? So I, well, I took that pattern of, of his, from his graphics designers. I made my own. Does this look familiar? Sure. <laughs> uh, I made others. This one didn't turn out as well. It, it looks wonderful on a woman's dress, not as a Hawaiian shirt, for at least for a guy. Anyway, and I did them all as Creative Commons attributions. For those of you who are wondering, uh, I went over to my, my brother's friend, and I paid him. He, he actually does that thing, so I paid him, and then I open sourced that this pattern. So it's it's not encumbered by somebody that, that wasn't doing it. Okay. Now, open sourcing is a shirt. This 
in the fabric industry is called a design. Okay, just to keep make things clear, the graphics is the design, the shirt pattern that says, hey, your sleeve is this long, your pocket goes here, and all that is called a shirt pattern. Now, we have more dirty laundry. <laughs> this is, this is, uh, you guys might have recognized this from yesterday. This is a pattern I got from Walmart, and it's McCall's or whatever, and it's really nice, and it fits me really good, but I can't open source that. So this pattern... Like I said, it's not the one my brother did. It, I went to a professional pattern making company. They uh, made a pattern. I am now able to open source this pattern. So step two of open sourcing shirts. Just so you know, it is expensive. Um, <laughs> oh, what's my next slide? Shirt patterns. Oh, even better if you don't. I sort of wish I'd done this. If you don't know, this freesewing.org is a wonderful place for sewing patterns for shirts. One minute? Shirts. <laughs> anyway, go there. <laughs> what, what do I got next? Um, okay. Hold up the red shirt. Here's a red shirt. This is not the red shirt I'm talking about. <laughs> He has a red shirt. This one, uh, some of you who are here with the, the Centos thing saw me wearing this one. I am making shirts. I will be selling them in a couple months. I will be making the shirts. And uh, that's how you open source, shirts. Oh, open source a shirt. <laughs> uh, do I have time for questions? Anybody have any questions? All right, let's, let's go on to the next okay. one. <laughs> All right, uh, next up we have, uh, theoretically, well, there we go. Uh, next up we have uh, something to do with Git with Sally O'Malley. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> You're all fancy. Which one did you send it to? Why does it keep doing that? I want you to be over here. I did send it to the other person. Doesn't. Oh, yes, it doesn't matter. Oh, did I um, share the one freaking slide? I want to send the one slide. I want to send all of This mic wasn't working? Test, test. It's working. It's just close. Do you want me to plug my What's that? I want to show my Sure, yeah. I just need a mirror. Oh, this is going well. <laughs> we got to hurry, right? I'll, yeah. be, I'll be super fast. <laughs> nice. All right. Mike, mic working? Can you guys hear it through the mic? Okay. It went black. This is one of the reasons we didn't want to switch. Screen. I know. <laughs> what the heck? Why isn't it? Is it the okay? cable? Do you have USB? Like, like, I don't need this. You do. Oh, I do. Somehow. Which box? The, the box on the floor with the light. The okay. Light has to be raised. If the light is not raised, the power cycle. Is See a box? Oh, on the wall. Yeah. Like this guy? No, the other one. The other black one. The other black one. That, I'm like, oh, wait, he's different now. Damn it. <laughs> like, there is no black box. There was a box here that I, I know the word is. box. <laughs> and I can't tell you. Sorry. No. That's right, okay. I need to find out. Is it coming up? Oh, there we go. There we go. Now I need to I mirror one. it. Can you come here real quick? Because you'll be able to do this. Why are we re-showing? That is a very good question. Uh, I just want to do, do mirror. 
Wait, you're, you should. I know. Have close it. it, close it. Yeah, I think it's confused. Let's do, oh, you don't have tap to click? No wonder I can't get anything done. <laughs> nope, that's not helpful. Display. Display. I just want Somebody, them. If, you, if, have... you can just set it to anything and I can just move it over too. It's fine. I don't know why it's doing this. I don't know why it's doing it either. Uh, you should have a prompt up here that says mirror, but it doesn't. I know. Yeah. Built-in display. Oh, so that one's two. And so it's, oh, but it's past three. Put two over there. Two over here? Yeah. Keep going. Sheesh, what the? Now hit apply. Apply. Now, no matter what happens, you just hit enter. Oh. Well, they now we have to move primary. our, now we got to like move the, okay, okay, okay. Gosh, oh, darn no, it. What no, that's good. That's good. It's good. Okay, okay. So what do you want to put over there? Um, This. That. This. My terminal power, and browser that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So just drag it over to a. Does this count as part of her minutes? No. It well, it can. It can. Where is my pointer? Okay. Bring that over. Come on. Other way. Left. Other way. Left. Other way. Now where did it go? Uh, wait. I'll, my hands uh, are all sweaty. I'm nervous. Uh, is it Chrome selected? Uh, yeah, you can do Chrome. No, I'm trying to get it selected. Then Alt. F7, and then... And this is the reason why no one else can give their lightning gun. Yes. All right. Give me one sec. Hold on. Someone else can go next. I feel bad. Um, yeah. 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 Well, we can do that for the next one, too. Uh, hold on. Alt F. I don't know if I hit it. Nope. It's okay. Just go on to the next one. My talk was on Sig Store, and I was going to point out that Sig Store offers Let's Encrypt for signing software, and I was going to redeem myself from my uh, talk yesterday because I didn't get to show you the output of my Git sign um, verify from Fetch It. And that's all I was going to do. So you'll have to trust me that it works. <laughs> yeah, there's no aspect. It, it's not giving the option. It's doing something really weird. Oh, I just switched the function key. All right, here you go. Really? All right, I'll just show you I'll that drive right your slides. Why don't you just go to... Oh, my God, you don't have a maximizer now? Uh, okay. You can just go to this one. And make it there. Okay. Yeah. All right, so... <laughs> here with um, git verify commit, if you go to the, if you go to the repo, um, sig store slash git sign, it gives you a very easy way to install git sign on your system. And um, when you do, you can sign every commit that you create. And now it's a little bit of a pain in the butt because it's keyless signing, which means every time you sign a commit, up, up pops an OIDC um, UI GUI thing. And you have to click if you want to sign with Microsoft, GitHub or whatever. It's OIDC. And then your 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 commits are signed keyless. It gets uploaded to a public record log. You can serve your own record log. You don't have to use the public one. Signed by the SIG store um, root it, uh, CA, but with um, managed by full CO. And then um, if you run fetch it and you opt into the verify git sign, you'll get this nice information about your commits. And you can see that uh, I just want to scroll up. There. That's not what's being. Yeah, it's split. fine. Oh, really? No, that's a projection of the screen. Of the. Of there, your... that's fine. You can okay. see it's a validated Git signature. Shows you the 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 subject and the issuer of the key. And the validated record entry means that that the content of that commit was verified from uh, signed by my email. That's it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> next. Yeah, so who's up next? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think it's Eric. Unit analysis for your data? All right. Did you send me something? Or are we doing the switching game? All I need is a browser. Okay. Give me a browser and I'll like, show you all my QB blog posts. It does better than me trying to make it in the slides. Do you hey. want to 
drive projection. Or you can just turn that one off if you want to use this one. Uh, you want to type the URL? Sure. Or it's going to take a second. I'm probably going to use Google. What? I know. Look at this over here, so it's a little less confusing. And then, uh, what's the? You want to just type it? Yeah, yeah. And then just throw the window off the left. Uh huh. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, you know now. So this is the window? Yep, yeah, and slide it to the left. Oh my god. Freaking out. Okay. Okay, so I know, right? Um this all started because like you know, anybody's like done da data analysis of any kind, it's like, you know, most numbers in real life have units, right? It's like, you know, it's a hundred kilograms or fifty miles. And when we do like matrix math and data science, like the first thing we do is like throw that right out the window, right? We just start treating them as, you know, numbers, right? And it got me to thinking, it's like, well, is that necessary? Um, and I don't really know. Um, but I started, I started trying to, I started trying to like say, well, what, what if I like, you know, what if we like kept the units and try to do the math? What would happen? And so, um, I don't know if I can scroll this. Oh, uh, yeah, just uh, like down here. So uh, and then you can just two, two finger scroll. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So, like, you know, here, I, I did a bunch of proofs. I, like, actually showed you can, like, take the inverse of a matrix that's got units. Um, and I'm going to skip all that because we have now three minutes or something. But, like, you know, here's a matrix X, and I'm going to keep the units. Um, and my Y, I'm going to keep it. So I'm going to say, well, what if we did so, the oldest data science in the book, right? Like linear regression. Um, so if we go here. I'm going to see if I can find the formula. Did I find the formula? Yeah, so like here's your linear regression formula, right? And it's using the Moore Penrose inverse applied to the Y. So it's like solving your equation. But if you have like more data, then columns, which mostly we do, that's how you, one of the ways you do it, right? The other way is like singular value to decomposition. Um, so I did some proofs um, and I invented this concept of unit signature. So like I did the reverse. It's like, what if we just throw the numbers out and keep the units? Um, because uh, <laughs> think about this, units are like data types. And so if you can do this, you could actually write software and I have um, that keeps the units along with your stuff. So it becomes like a data type thing for your check, type checking. Um, and so I started following the formula and just applying my new unit signature laws that I proved in a previous post. Um, and if I do that, <clears throat> go all the way through, this is my unit signature operator. I invented an operator. Um, but, um, the... Uh, and if you do it, you end up with this. And so, like, my my weights, like the linear weights that you solve for, have these units. Um, and that's actually cool because it all works. Um, if you <laughs> like, if you actually do this, you know, if you multiply it out, you find out that like, oh, look at these, you know, centimeters and years cancel. And what's left is kilograms, which is exactly the unit of the thing you were solving for. So, like, I followed this all the way through and did not lose faith. And sure enough, you can do data science with unit analysis. Uh, Any questions? <laughs> all right. Well, Oleg has a question. Right, exactly. Um, so by the way, part of the reason I started doing this is because I actually have um, type, I have like type level unit analysis in Scala where like if you screw the units up, it's actually a type error. It'll fail to compile. Um, and I wanted these kind of laws so that I could actually 
you know, apply that. And so you could give it, you know, matrices with units as types and it comes out with the correct types. I care. All right, thank you. Next up, open source with, uh, sorry, the importance of DNI in open source, which originally I thought was P and I, and took a while for me to figure out that, that was actually a D on the whiteboard and not a P. And I am unaware of what P and I is. Pets <laughs> and inclusivity. Right. Uh, so do you have slides? I have no slides. You have no slides. Y'all have me. So who here is not a computer science major? Great, this is good. So I put this up originally as the importance of DNI. And I'm glad to see so many different majors because we all bring something different to the table. I was an animal science major and extension education. I don't palpate cows in open source, but you learn how to ask questions. You learn how to look at things differently. And the importance of DNI within open source and in computers and anything else is everyone brings something different to the table. How you ask a question, how you see things. And as a career in computers, I started off as tech support, answering phones. Then I moved into development, software management, operations. And again, how you look at a problem, how you solve a problem, how you investigate that problem is so different based on your background. Because someone else might go right to the log, someone else might go to the screen. You know, taking something out of the equation to see how that changes things. So these are the importance of diversity in computers and in open source. And one thing, I went to a imposter syndrome talk from Major Hayden, if anyone knows Major. And you would think he would never have imposter syndrome. At Rackspace, he had his picture on the wall. He had his own little badge sticker. I mean, Major was a big deal. Major knew everything. If you had a question, you went to Major. And to hear him talk that he had doubts makes you wonder, well, if Major has doubts, it's OK to have doubts. This is kind of going to Pat's talk. But so you also realize that when you go to a conference, you are the only female in the room. Half the time, I'm the only female on a team, the only one in the room. We joked at Open Source Summit this past year that we actually had to wait five seconds at the bathroom. You know you're at Grace Hopper when you have to wait in line for the bathroom. In fact, in Houston, I kind of knocked on the men's door and said, incoming, and let a group in. We would have been there for 30 minutes. But those are not our normal problems. Our normal problem is we are the only one there. So we do analysis of our communities, and I hope everyone does that. We send out diversity and inclusion surveys to see where we are. And it's not just a gender issue. How you word your questions. Do you feel like you're a minority in the community? Do you feel like you're a minority in your country? Because in your country, you may not be a minority. In your community, you might be. So asking questions that aren't just A or B are important to find out what's actually going on in your community. Because it's how those people look at the problems, have the discussions. That is what is important about diversity and inclusion within open source. And we don't think about that. You know, it's like, well, everyone in the room has a computer science degree, and we all think the same, and we all, you know. So that was why I wanted to come up here and talk. And the fact is, if you notice you're the only one in the room, put in a conference talk, speak, run for a leader posi leadership position. Remember, I started in tech support. I am now on three board of directors. You know, if you put your heart and soul in these open source projects, you can do anything you want. And I think that is the lesson. So don't think because you don't look like the person next to you that you can't be something. And that's my talk. All righty. 
Uh, next up, we have uh, an unknown talk. It's one of two. I don't know which choice they're going to make. My talk is entitled, It's Okay Not to Know Things. <laughs> do you have slides or anything? Or? I do not have slides, but I have a timer. Okay. <laughs> it's okay not to know things. They tell me in a presentation, you open with a joke. Here's the joke. On the first day of your job, you know how to do it. <laughs> That's the joke. Those of you who have not had jobs in the tech industry before, this is how it works. They hire you because they think eventually you can learn how to do this job. They do not hire you because you know how to do it. They do not pay you because you know how to do it. They did not get you there because you know how to do it. It's okay not to know things. This is what your team members are for. This is where you have an opportunity to learn and ask questions. Because a lot of the time, the things that we're doing are just, that's the process we ended up with. Why? Uh, yeah, it's like, it's just, it's just what we do. Like Steve, when he was here 35 years ago, picked it. Well, Steve retired. Can we do it differently? We have this thing called like web servers now. <laughs> And so it's okay not to know things. Ask questions if you're new in your industry. Ask them all the time because it's okay not to know things. We need people to ask what's going on because half the time the people who have been there forever don't actually know what's going on. They just know what they're doing. <laughs> and that's a big difference. <laughs> so, Ask the questions. Don't be afraid when you get a new job and you don't know how to do literally any single thing they've assigned you and you don't actually know what they've assigned you. Um, oh, wait, on so day one, uh, where's the ticket system? Oh, yeah, someone should probably tell you that. Yeah, yeah, they really should. But you don't know that and you know to ask about it. Well, what about, oh, we had this weird grub bootloader problem that like exploded the box. Yeah, if you don't know how to fix it, you don't know how to fix it. And that's fine. It's okay not to know things as long as you're willing to learn the answers. And that's the other piece of it. Um, don't be that person that always doesn't know, but don't be afraid to not know. It's fine. It's okay. <laughs> when I started at my current job, I did not know how to do it. I had, I had built zero RPMs in my entire life. When I became one of the developers for Scientific Linux that builds RPM packages for a Linux distribution, I did not know how to do this. But I knew to ask the questions and to learn the answers. And that's what this industry is about. That's what we're here for. That's what your peers are for. If you've seen someone up here giving a presentation, they genuinely, meaningfully, actually want you to ask them your questions. This Q&A section at the end of everything isn't a joke that's just there to like make them feel better. They want your questions, and I want you to ask them your questions. I'm going to beg you. I'm going to plead you with you. Don't be that person that sits in the back and thinks, well, I don't know what's going on, so I should keep, like, it'll be, like, I'll just sit in the back here. None of us know what's going on. There's too much in the tech industry to keep track of one interface in the kernel. Um, there's what? seven, 800 packages in rel that are just binary type enumeration. You can't keep track of that. No one knows all of it. No one knows half of it. No one knows a third of it. Don't be intimidated by your ignorance. Be intimidated by the fact that you're afraid to ask the question and chase that and don't be afraid of it. And with that, I have 42 seconds left. All right. <laughs> All right, next up we have academic study and community matters. <laughs> and do we do we have a VKP? Oh, okay. Wait, that might be coming up. Uh, all right. <laughs>
And so next up, we also have cross-disciplinary inspiration for information systems, which you can give if you prepared it. But they were last on the list and weren't sure they were actually going to want to prepare, uh, present it. But I don't see, I don't know what the guy's name is, but I don't see it. Uh, no, no, that's Alex. Or, no. Yeah, it's one of uh, Alex Plum. Yeah. Plum. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, so is he hiding in the back over there? Okay. <laughs> he just came up. He knew he was coming up and said, nope, I'm out. Uh, all right. Well, then we will transition to what is currently scheduled, which is um, so. If you're unaware of this, DevConf US, uh, normally we do an Easter egg talk. Uh, so something that on the face of it sounds like a good idea and an interesting talk. Then you get there and you find out it is insane. So <laughs> this year, we're doing a small variant, which is uh, Adam has had uh, some good luck with a concept called slideshow karaoke. <laughs> we will need participants from the crowd. Uh, and uh, I didn't see if you wrote me back. Do you want to use your machine or mine? I'm going to use my machine. Okay. Um, so we're starting in 55 minutes. We'll, exactly. Uh, so what we would love, though, is um, because the, the point of this exercise is it is you don't know what exactly you'll be presenting. Uh, so if we can get some volunteers to get ready to present. All right. Uh, maybe we should, let's say, uh, how about uh, guess a number between 1 and 10? Um, and, uh, and then I'll figure out the winner. Let's see. I have 10 <laughs> fingers. Let's see. All right. So hold up a number of fingers. Uh, what, how many fingers is that? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. We got, none of you have gotten it. All right. Let's try again. I will do another number. Apparently I pick odd numbers. All right. One more time. Numbers. Or I can't count one of the two. Uh, it looks like Jen is up. All right. Uh, then we will go in order of, I don't know, first name. I, I don't uh, we'll figure it out. All right. So these are the rules. And we should have titled it, would you like to give a lighting talk? I have nothing else, nothing to say. Um, this is your opportunity. Um, anyway, sorry. That was funny. Um, <laughs> All right. So you can use this is stick, awesome. You can use the stick mic or you can use this one. Let's not have them. Both okay, well, let me just use the okay. Mic. Okay. And it's autoplay, right? It's autoplay, 15 seconds a slide, five okay. slides, and you go. So this guy has a big idea in the form of a light bulb. Look how lit up it is. <laughs> it means you too can hold a light bulb in your hands and have great ideas. Just know you too can do this. And look, your brain is inside this multicolored skull. You, too, can have a multicolored skull. Look at that delightful green you have in your occipital region. Isn't it wonderful? And then you can evolve into a wooden owl. And the green, really, is symbolized by the moss. Just know that anything is possible, because if you can, with a light bulb in your hands. <laughs> And it looks like the character from Cars has come into the slide deck. He's become a planner. Maybe he was a car once, but now he's a planner. And I have no idea what this means. I think the brain may have exploded inside the multicolored skull. And I'm afraid that these two raccoons had rabies and are playing basketball. The end. <laughs> well done, well done. All right, I did want to ask, are we still live streaming? I pray to God. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, so who's next? You now need to hold up. Uh, let's do let's do five fingers. Maybe we'll figure it out faster. I'll put it in my pocket. Uh, all right, so hold them up. All right, uh, Niche, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 
yeah. that is for you. Oh, I can see the size in there. That's much easier. We can we can hide it from you. Oh, that would be interesting. Roll okay, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go, go. <laughs> All right. Um, have you ever been pensive enough that you turned into a moose? I feel like <laughs> you're out in the hills and <laughs> I, I, we're really going animal theme this time. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like think that's what Amy was thinking right now when I called it a moose. <laughs> that's a go. Oh, they're both goats? Um, oh, so we're going animal theme this time. Yeah, so, um, you know, you're in the hills. You're thinking, what do you want to do next? Um, and someone suggests horse racing, jockeying. And that's what you end up doing. Um, you're racing off to DEF CON. And then you see Jen present, and she's hilarious. So you just lose your mind. <laughs> Um, he's telling us the end. I don't know to say at that point. There's a sheep. <laughs> that was really good. Amy, are you on the list? Would you like to present? Uh, I was actually thinking about running you the same one. Uh, let's give it a... No, wait. Let's wait so you forget some of it. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, hold up some numbers. Uh, back left corner. I can't quite see who you are. <laughs> right, I will... I'll I will start to use Adam to ratify that I'm actually being honest about the numbers. I'm not picking favorites. <laughs> All right, Adam, you want to start it up for us? All right, I'll start. Yeah. <laughs> the paintbrush, creativity, spark your mind. All this and more. Welcome to the BU School of Fine Arts. <laughs> <laughs> A little known degree program here at the BU School of Fine Arts is our parkour school. <laughs> our parkour program is one of the strongest in the nation. The art of motion is our most popular class here at BU. Uh, we go from complete beginners all the way to flips. And it, in the really advanced courses, of course, you actually blend different disciplines. You learn how to paint while flipping. <laughs> so the way that works is actually more blood goes to your head. So you can be even more creative. And this will really give you wings and let you take off and let your creativity really soar. So here at the BU School of Fine Arts, we only use the finest duck feathers. And uh, we actually pull them right from the fens. You might see them on the way back. And uh, we also have a culinary program, which not a lot of people know about. We developed this one in collaboration with uh, the Disney company, of course. And uh, our chefs are in resorts all around the world. Uh, we call them pancake artists. That's just a term we like to use. Anyway. Who's next? Hold up some numbers. You got to hold up different numbers. <laughs> uh, do we just have the two people here? Or is there anybody else holding up numbers? Come on, you did it every other time. What, what do you got? Uh, all right. Uh, Who's closest? Yeah, let's say it's Troy's closest. Oh, how many? How many? Oh, so did, he, so did Troy, so he's up. Troy's up. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start before you push the button. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was walking through the forest, just acting, oh, just acting like the chicken I was because I was scared of everything. I saw this giant fly flying around, and I thought it was a bee. But in reality, it was a stormtrooper. <laughs> so I had to duck behind the trees. They were shooting around, shooting around. And I didn't know what to do, so I hid behind my desk, pretended I was another stormtrooper, Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> but I set, I set off my, my fireworks so that, so that my uh, 
rebel friends could come find me. And my fireworks went up. And they went, bang. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they came zooming in at light speed. And they rescued me. And then we had... <laughs> we had a party and my, my best pug friend, Frodo, came and licked me all over. And that was how I got out of... Indoor, of course it was. Thank you. All right. Test. Hello. All right. Uh, who's up next? Let's see. Are you going to go? No? All right. Anybody else? Well, then I guess you win. You're up. I win by default. Exactly. The best way to win. You actually also had the right number. Ah. <laughs> Weirdly enough. All righty. Space when I'm ready. One space and that's it. The fact is, penguins are the single most important creature on the face of the Earth. They control the universe through the power of their mind. For example, this emperor penguin is currently making me give this presentation. <laughs> and so, we have to talk to ourselves about woodworking and the epic advances that penguins are making within this important field of climate engineering. Woodworking penguins are at the forefront of modern practices for architecture and design. <laughs> and so we have to work within them as we talk about things like, how do we send penguin woodworkers into space? <laughs> These questions are in national importance and perhaps the greatest ideas of mankind can ever have is truly to look at our penguin woodworkers and say, can they fly helicopters? <laughs> the answer to this of course being, the, the helicopters are not terribly handicap accessible and we're working into this project. It's important that we increase our disability access because these penguin woodworkers are controlling my mind and making me think about gummy bears. All I want in life are gummy bears. I don't know why, I don't have a choice in the matter. But what I do know is that if we don't put the penguin woodworkers into space, I won't ever get off this podium. Very well done. I am curious, is, uh, is the Penguin working another division at, at Boston University? Is there a collaboration there with the Department of Fine Arts? I, I think it's the American Zoological Society. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, so. Do you want to do this? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. All right, so do we have any other takers? We have several more slides. We don't want to waste them. <laughs> That's the point of the exercise. <laughs> I guess it will be Sally, sometimes known as Molly. That's my sister's name, Molly. I'm really curious to know what's going to come out of my mouth because, like, I never know. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> Next. Next. What the? No. Okay, now I'm feeling a little better. This is making me feel calm. I'm going inside. I'm not worried about my children. Minimal width. No. Next. Okay, why am I getting the strangest ass slides in the world? And where is this man's? head and is this some sort of fitness party okay all right i i, I, I no no what did he see what is he looking at <laughs> this is really nerve-wracking. I am never doing this again. <laughs> never, ever. Oh, my goodness. Okay, next. Next. <laughs> I, really thought, I really thought the opening was the best. It was a very good mimic. It was really, that was really, really well done. All right. Uh, who else? Do we have any other takers? All right. 
uh, there will be no reference to operating systems. Okay. I, that's fine. I can talk about other things. Sure, sure you can. There's one thing you should learn from this conference. It is that dogs are the master race of the world, and they are going to take over everything, but they're disguising it with their cuteness. And uh, they, their, their enemies are the uh, tiger parrots who are <laughs> flitting around, and they uh, use a field of deception so that you think that they're just pigeons when they're in Boston. But uh, like the fearsome braying horse that comes through the city um, in the guise of the tea, uh, <laughs> uh, it, all these animals are around you at all times in disguise and uh, ready to uh, ready to attack like a um, weasel or stoat or ferret or something just leaping leaping probably to their own doom because they don't really judge distance very well i think it's probably going to happen here I, um, and i can't even see this picture very well i have to look here we've got a, a bear in a compromising <laughs> position here, and that's uh, probably how things are going to end for us all in, with the animals attacking the, the world. Um, and there were no operating systems. All right. Do we have any other takers? We have several more slides for your enjoyment. Come on, we gotta have somebody. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me here today. Um, it's a very important discussion we'll uh, about to dive into. So when it comes to the Serengeti, the main thing is to leap. Leap as big and as high as you can because you need to get out of the way of the sand as it's coming after you. In this photo, you'll see the sand is chasing the quadcopter thing, right? And, and the most important part of doing this is to make sure that your actions, your maneuvers are, are following the careful martial arts. In this case, the swan maneuver is a good way to get yourself out of the way of that sand. Whoa, like that, right? Just keep that in mind as you're going through the Serengeti. And in this particular case, you see we, we were able to capture in stop motion uh, 100,000 racers all doing the whoo motion at the same time. <laughs> and and the, 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 the way that they moved caused the light to reflect to make them all appear the same color. Now, I, there is a caution. This is a cautionary tale. Whatever you do, don't fall in love with that which is toxic to you. Okay, <laughs> whatever it is, don't forget. It will not turn its head away from you. It will learn. It will just, you know, it'll bite you and eat you up. So yeah, that's all. Um, and the last thing is, as you're, the key thing is, as you're, as you're contemplating your changes in life and whether you're going to become, you know, one of these Serengeti racers and actually do these movers, just remember, eat carefully, chew your food before you swallow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. Very well done. Uh, we have one more set. Two. Two more sets. So uh, do we have any takers? We have two more sets. Don't want... Yeah, we could go back to the animal one. That's no, that is impossible. Never mind. <laughs> All right. There will probably, if you've noticed, there's actually been a lot of animals in general. So this one, of course. All of the different animals. This, of course, will not have any. It was a ferret. How do you know the difference? The markings on the face. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> So even though we're not talking about animals, we apparently have dolphin bananas who are eating grapes. So the dolphin banana can also be used as a gun. So you just turn it around so that the face is in your hand, and then you can shoot everybody. <laughs> and you have to make ugly faces while you're shooting. <laughs> ah. But after you have used all your banana bullets, you can also get your enemies by dropping the peel on the ground. And then as they're walking, <laughs> they will squish and slide to their doom. But certain types of bananas can be turned into tents and give you safety and warmth in the dark of night while you're on the mountain under the stars. Are there any more? 
<gasps> but if you alienate your dolphin banana, he turns into the devil. Notice his horns. Notice his fangs. The dolphin banana can be your friend or your enemy. Thank you for the educational moment on the dolphin banana. Uh, I've I've actually been curious for a long time about the the various you know kind of life uh, expectancy etc. You know life path of, of the dolphin banana. I, I know Adam was too. Uh, so we really appreciate the education. Uh, all right, who's who's up next? Me. <laughs> All right. Hope, hopefully, I get a good set. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Should I have? Uh, I liked your start of the once upon a time. Uh, so there was a student of basically like how does art come together, right? So you you want to bring the pieces together, and they're trying to understand at the BU School of Fine Arts, of course, um, how to merge these animals and uh, bring together an amorphic picture. And then sometimes when you make a mistake, uh, you end up with things like this. So this is where we cross those pictures together, and it just, it it really is not bringing out the mood that you really intended. So you really, when you're at the BU School of Fine Arts, you got to be careful of that. However, as you can see, when you get truly good from the parkour school, you actually are able to, uh, you know, like run with the hyenas, right? I mean, this is really important. And, you know, and then, of course, ultimately, when you can kind of bring it all together, you can actually, uh, you know, be a lovely, calm goat, maybe? Um, <laughs> llama. Uh, and so I'm also not good at animal identification. Um, but... There's always a danger, right? You can you can get too close to the sun. This is this is the problem. You don't want to have too large an impact on the overall world because you can just just destroy it. And I, I mean, what could happen? The penguins will take over. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, one of these days, we will also try to do the uh, slideshow karaoke that Adam and I have been debating about for several years, which is where you see the set of slides first, and then you have to give the talk. But you have multiple people give the same, like from the same set of slides. So we will not be doing that today because it is two minutes of five, and uh, we don't want you here anymore. Oh, sorry. We, we think you should be able to have a chance to go and have dinner and all those kinds of things before the party at 7 p.m. Uh, do not miss it. Uh, it will be a lot of fun. The theme is space exploration. Uh, so who knows what that could mean? Uh, it could be the penguins. Yes. Oh, yeah. So the party is at 7 p.m. Uh, it is at the Photonics building, uh, which uh, is kind of like down the street a little bit. Um, but it's across the street. It's very, very obvious because it's a tall, silvery building. Um, and... It does have a beam of light on the side. That's right. And it is on the ninth floor uh, in a big, huge, open glass in area. So it's like uh, got great views of the city, uh, especially at night. Uh, so we strongly encourage you to come. Um, and don't forget, you will need a ticket, which you can collect from registration. Or if we have leftover tickets, we will have them at the door. So if you don't have a ticket, uh, we probably have some extras. Uh, follow us on Twitter, and we will definitely announce if we run out. Okay. Yes, there's food and drinks. Yes, exactly. And prizes, maybe prizes, definitely games. And a DJ. Unfortunately, we couldn't make Kitar Bear happen this year. Sadly, it was all on me. I apologize. Um, but hopefully next time. So, but we do have a DJ uh, who is not only a professional DJ, but also a professional Red Hatter. So, uh, with, I have been assured space exploration themed music <laughs> so we'll see where it goes all right thanks everybody